What is it you want, Barry? What do you want? You, you want the moon? Just say the word and I'll throw a lasso around it and pull it down. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, dying times here. Come with me if you want to live. That's it, man. Game over, man. Game over. The Force will be with you. Always. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to 20th Century Geek and part two of our epic, epic Star Wars crossover. I'm being joined by Chris and Dave from VHS Strikes Back and Comics in Motion and Mike from Genuine Chit Chat. How are you doing, guys? All good, yeah, Scott. fantastic. You guys all good? Are you raring to go? Absolutely. Are you excited by the prequel films? Uh, I'm going to be defending all of them, so that's going to be me. Talking <laughs> to you guys about what happened in the Clone Wars. Mike's, got, defending Mike's you. got his tin hat on, ready to go, and I'm armed <laughs> to the teeth. Well, it's, it's my show next as well, so you know when you come on my show next week, you're going to see I'm going to be in really bad mood because of this conversation. <laughs> <laughs> this is where the split really happens. This is where you become the Trade Federation, and uh, nobody wants to talk to you. <laughs> uh, before we start, then, guys, I just got to say, Misa, Misa, so happy you are all here. Okay, day. Oh, That's right. Yeah. <laughs> That's a good impression. <laughs> That's right, ladies. You've been working on that all week, haven't you? <laughs> not, just this, not just a week, whilst I've been walking the dog, I've had some really interesting looks. Whilst... <laughs> <laughs> so, guys, let's sort of start. I'm going to go through all of us and we'll sort of talk about how we first felt when those trilogies hit. So, 1999, we'd obviously had the first one, uh, Phantom Menace. And we were hearing things about it, I remember seeing photos, and all this stuff was coming out. So, uh, Dave, how did you feel when you first knew about Phantom Menace and what were your thoughts? I was so excited. I thought after Return of the Jedi, I would never see anything on the big screen again that was that was anything remotely uh, about Star Wars. And so when when there was rumours about, and then when it got announced that you know they were going to explore the whole uh, Anakin part of the story, you know, again we we. I'd obsessed about this with my mates and, and, you know, we talked about what could have possibly happened before A New Hope and oh, I was absolutely excited as anything for any movie. I think probably Avengers Endgame coming up this year is probably the closest, you know, I've got to that. But I would say, honestly, Phantom Menace was probably higher at that time. And, um, yeah, do, do you want to go... Uh, do you want me to tell you how I felt after, or should we get onto that in a bit? Yeah, we'll, we'll get onto that in a bit. <laughs> okay. but I, I think, yeah, I think that's it. It's, it's just the pre, yep. the pre okay. first. So, uh, Chris, what about yourself? Uh, how were you feeling? I was really looking forward to it. Obviously, Ewan McGregor was in his infancy as an actor. I remember him from a show called Lipstick on My Collar, which is a proper old school Channel Four one from like the early nineties, and. Obviously, he'd been in a couple of other movies around that time. So it was sort of like his biggest break more than anything. And with it being Star Wars, I was all in. Now, I never went to the cinema to watch it. I got a dodgy copy on video with The <laughs> Matrix. And to this day, I said this to Dave. I was totally sorry to Dave when he's heard his loads of blue board out of his head that the dodgy copy, I thought the pod racing was because it was a dodgy video, you know, pirate copy. And it wasn't. So uh, that, 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 that's how I remember it. I just remember, I remember the game for the N64, which I've actually got to my left. I've never actually played it since I got the N64 back. But yeah, it, it was always one of them things. It was a proper pop culture moment in my life. I think, I think you know, that's a really good point that this was like a pop culture milestone. I think that's one of the things that, that is going to come up when we talk about this is that I, the, the hype around this was incredible. Um, you know, I remember seeing things in like mainstream newspapers and things like that that this was going to be the biggest thing ever. Um, it really was like a major thing. Yeah. But uh, so, so Mike, you obviously, you know, you were um, a little younger than us. This, this is <laughs> your first younger. trilogy. Yeah, this is your first trilogy. So how how are you feeling when the you know? Well, I the problem is uh, to obviously age myself with this. In 1999, I was five. Oh my! So God. brutal honesty when you guys so were like. Old. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, I know. Sorry, guys. Um, I've got a, I've got a grey moustache. If that helps, so my body, my facial hair for some reason thinks I'm like a sixty year old man. So that helps. Some people have thought I'm forty, so they've met me and gone. They think, like, guess my age? Oh, I think you're forty. Oh, fuck. Come on. Like, but um, I'm not. With Phantom Menace, the problem is with me is obviously as I am of essentially the prequel generation, I don't remember much about it. But my girlfriend Megan, who I've mentioned before, she's not wasn't the biggest Star Wars fan, and I've kind of forced her into it. Um, she says when she thinks of Star Wars, the thing she remembers is Darth Maul, not because of his obviously limited uh, involvement in the movie or uh, screen time. It's more because just like I've noticed this time round, when Force Awakens came out, it's Kylo Ren helmets everywhere that was like the go-to logo for the sequel trilogy when force awakens was announced and i think darth maul's face was basically the the thing which was associated with uh, the prequel so in all honesty i i probably only started watching star wars around episode two when that actually was out so i didn't when i got into star wars i got into four five six and one and i think two as well so it, it's a bit different for me but i did go to the cinema to see the revenge of the sith Mm. Sorry. So the first, yeah, <laughs> no, it's, it's, it's a different, it's a different generation. It's a different time. And I think, it's like for me, I think nineteen ninety nine was 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 a really exciting year. Like I say, I was I was eighteen. Um, I was about to go off to university. I was really excited. It was, it was a, that was a big summer for me. Um, we'd had like the Matrix kicked it off. And I remember, the, you know, when the Matrix came out in June, I was really excited. That thing blew me away. I was like, oh, this is amazing. This is what's going to be, you know. And, and then I know like Fight Club was coming up late in the year, and then you had Star Wars. So like, ninety nine was going to be a big year, and then it arrived. <laughs> <laughs> and if I'm perfect, I, I, you know, I'm very much like I see a lot of things like opening weekend or as soon as possible these days. But it wasn't <clears> so lucky back then. And I remember other people going to see it before me, and a friend, a friend of mine, I said, to me, "Is it? Is it you know, what is it? What's it like? So is it all good?" Because we obviously didn't have the internet; wasn't as prevalent back then. Really, I didn't have you know there wasn't social media things, so you couldn't just go on and just get the instant um, early reactions and stuff. I I used to get uh, magazines called SFX and Total Film, and that was mm, where I got my. I used to get them. From. Brilliant, but a friend of mine he'd seen it, and all he would say to me was. Um, yeah, I think you need to see it yourself. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, and I, I couldn't decipher. I was like, is that good? Is that bad? I don't know. Because um, the things I remember, like I say, Darth Maul is a really good point because I think he is he has got a fantastically iconic look. that, And they used him sparingly as well, which is really good. But I remember all the posters as well, like the little picture of Jake Lloyd with the, po- with the shadow of Darth Vader and... Um, then you had like the painted image with all the characters and stuff on. Like it was, it was, you know, it was brilliant. I was all in on those kinds of things. So I was really excited going into this. Um, but I suppose really let's get into the film. Let's have a look. I'm just, I'm just sort of, uh, I've got it here in front of me. Actually, you know, you said about Darth Maul hmm. in sort of like they use his face on the disc. Like he is the sort of, hmm. The face of this film it's, it's really bizarre how he became so synonymous with this He's film in it for like five minutes being... <laughs> yeah it's like three lines of dialogue but it also shows yeah it shows how piss poor everything else is if five minutes of screen time is what it takes to be really good in this i think in all um, honesty it was uh, not, not to be a uh nitpicker but i think it was actually literally 17 minutes of screen time he's got which really? for a two and a 15 yeah it was it was something really weirdly small because if you think about it he's like he pops up at near the start and then pops up again and there's the end so he's not yeah. actually and the end is obviously three different the, the finale is often the case is three different things going on at once so i'm, mm-hmm. I'm i'll have to double check that while we're chatting but I'm, I'm pretty sure it was actually he's actually only on screen for 13 uh, 17 minutes so which is even more astounding for a two hour 15 minute movie <laughs> Yeah, and a lot, a lot of that's like the the end fight, isn't it? So mm. it, it's quite impressive. But let's. Sort of, I'm not even going to explain the plot to these films because I started to write things out and it, I I I started to bore myself. <laughs> <laughs> um, so let's get into it. The film starts, and you know the whole sort of like Phantom Menace is based around um, the idea that. There is a republic, uh, but a trade federation has separated off and uh, they have a stockade surrounding Naboo and Jedis have been sent in to negotiate. That's our starting point. I'm going to throw it from there. What are your thoughts on the Phantom Menace? Who's jumping in? I don't want to be rude. I'm like, I guess I'll go first because I probably hate it the least. I, I will say, though, it was a weird 
thing with me because obviously I watched it as a kid, like a young kid when it first came out. And a then, youngling. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Good old younglings. And um, yeah, I was I started to think they can't call them younglings at the Disney world, you know, where they have all the things because the only time they're ever called younglings in the whole of Star Wars is when Anakin kills them all. <laughs> so they, they can't actually, they said you can't call them the actors in Star, in the Star Wars galaxy's edge stuff. Can't call the children younglings, which I thought was cracked up because I call, I call, I call my nieces younglings. I just call children younglings. I heard that. I was like, that's a good point. But anyway, um, with Phantom Menace, I, I watched it. I like, I remember kind of liking it a bit, but then it kind of faded a while because obviously between Phantom Menace and Revenge of the Sith, that's like six years. So I went and saw Revenge of the Sith 2005. So I was like 11. And so around that time, I, I was my view of it was kind of uh, skewed because obviously I was so young. You can't really take a 10 year old's opinion on a movie if you're like, you know, 20 plus. But it's, I remember liking it and then skipping certain bits because I'm on VHS and I used to skip past sort of boring bits, which happened a lot in the second one as well. But then when I got back into Star Wars, which is after my dad sort of uh, passed away, I kind of, and when obviously Force Awakens started getting mentioned and then everyone I knew was like, I haven't seen all the Star Wars films. Mike, watch them all with me. And then I've seen them, that's, I've seen them so many times. I've rewatched them. And each time, when I first rewatched it recently, I was like, oh man, this sucks. <laughs> this is way worse than I remember. And then each time I watch it, it actually gets better except Jar Jar gets worse. So now I'm at the point where I'm like, this is not that bad. I'd probably give it six out of 10, maybe, you know, if you can kind of think the end scene is so cool, but Jar Jar is just so fucking unbearable. <laughs> and the older I get, the worse he is. Cause I'm like, he had nothing to the plot. He didn't need to be in it. He just had to have Qui-Gon know vaguely about a Gungan place. And you could have completely wiped him unless we're going to go deep dive and do the uh, Darth Binkus sort of no, um, theory. No, that's, no, no, is, no, no. Cause that's not, cause that's again, that's, these, these conspiracy theorists apologizing for a crap film and I, it winds me up um yeah i mean you can play about jar jar but let's be honest sort of like jake lloyd is terrible in this as yeah. well so mm. you know it's it's interesting that sort of I, the bit do you know what, watching this this time something really struck me that that i i sort of knew was part of it but really stuck out to me this time was the horrendously racist stereotypes that they seem to use throughout the film. <laughs> Newt Gumray and stuff, the viceroys of the <laughs> Trade yeah, Federation. The viceroys, the viceroys, the viceroys of the Trade Federation, they are so sort of like 1930s yellow peril. They might as well be called Fu Manchu. Like, <laughs> it's horrendous. It is so bad. And then obviously you get the sort of um, vaguely sort of like West Indian, you know, sort of Caribbean um, sort of, uh, you know, uh, what they call the Gungans yep. or that sort of thing. It's all like, it's just like, oh my god! Like no, again, like I know George Lucas is. I mean, he's solely responsible for this. Like you know, he's writing and directing. There's nobody else to blame on this. I can't find fault with anybody else. <laughs> and sort of, it's just the actors have obviously gone along with it, and it just. Yeah, I think well, just to jump in and then I, I'll let let Chris sort of give his perspective. But I mean, I, I, when I first watched it, and the, the levels of excitement were so high, and I'd seen some negative things, you know, from reviews and what have you at the time, but I wasn't really listening. I was just had a tunnel vision that I needed to see this movie, and I watched it, and then I think I convinced myself that I liked it. You know, at the end of it, I was like, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it was good, that. And it, it was only afterwards I was thinking, nah, it really wasn't, was it? It was like half, or not even <laughs> half, you know, but The Matrix was the, the the absolute best thing that came out that summer. Um, and I just, I found myself getting more and more annoyed afterwards about <laughs> how crap it was. And one of the things I, I think that runs through all three of these and i think we're all four of us we're going to be a little bit all over the place with this trilogy i don't i don't think we're going to have a a polarized opinion but in the initial trilogy the first trilogy so four five and six you know there was a george lucas wasn't the powerhouse that he was when he created this prequel trilogy Mm. And there's that famous bit, isn't there, where uh, Harrison Ford shouted across to, to George Lucas, you can write this shit, but you can't say it. You know, George, move yeah. your lips yeah. when you're typing. You know, so, so people would push back on his terrible dialogue and change it. Whereas because he is Bertie Big Bollocks in this prequel, no one really had the kahunis to, to sort of stand up to him and say, look, this is just terrible. 
you need to change this. And I think some of the, the acting, some of the lines of dialogue, it's just awful throughout. And it, it is really hard, even when you go into this, on this rewatch, with the expectation that Jar Jar is so annoying and he's just got, you know, silly, um, like, Disney Junior type lines, he still manages mm. to really wind me up. <laughs> <laughs> well, talk about talk about George Lucas. One of the things that so I've, I went back and watched a couple of like post Phantom Menace interviews, <clears throat> and one of the things he sort of you know it's, it it feels a little bit like he's on clean up duty. You know, he's having to sort of make some uh, crap up, to try and cover himself, and he's a bit like, well, you know, these are kids' films, and they're you know it's aimed at children, blah blah blah. So he, and he's trying to identify that. Basically, like Jake Lloyd is in there as a child for you to identify with as a kid, but Jar Jar is there as sort of like the comedy entertainment. But then you sort of like I remember in the interview, the sort of person ends up asking, says, "Okay, well I get that." So, but but what's basically sort of what it boiled down to is, so why is it all about a trade federation yeah. then? Because that's not for kids, <laughs> and actually the politics gets incredibly boring. Like <laughs> I had to watch the pol- like the politics of Phantom Menace. It literally took me until I was about I think sixteen, seventeen of rewatching it for the umpteenth time to actually fully understand the plot enough to explain it to someone else of what the fuck they were actually talking about. It's <laughs> mental. <laughs> I, th- I think it, all what you've said, you're not far off how I feel, any of you. I think what I found bizarre with Jar Jar Binks is I never got the hype. I think, as you've said, as you watch it more, he just fucking annoys you. And, <laughs> and I, the more I watched it, I was like, this, this is obviously the formula that in The Force Awakens, all the ones that have come since that, they use this, they have a droid of some sort, don't they? We have BB-8, in, you know, and, and you've got... Um, I can't think of the droid, but in, you, you had in, um, oh my God, I've, I've had a memory blank. The, uh, the prequel to, that could be that one as the well. One yeah. in Rogue uh, but, One. But the, yeah. Rogue One, sorry. So you get that comedy timing. With Jar Jar Binks, whoever decided or, or signed that off, once fucking shooting off <laughs> into the Death Star because George, it's just not, it's all George. You're so right, Scott. It's fucking rubbish. It's absolutely, and this time was the worst time I've ever experienced that. I never bothered me. And I remember, as I said, I had a pirate copy, and I remember watching it thinking, that was fucking shit. But I kept thinking, <laughs> you know what? It's because I've got a dodgy copy. And I went out and bought it on video, I think, not on DVD at the time. And I watched it and thought, oh my God, it is fucking shit. It wasn't the copy. And what I find worse is that the two best characters in the film, for me personally, are Qui-Gon and Darth Maul. And they get fucking killed. You've got Ewan McGregor, who is the most (laughs) placid, boring bastard ever, who absolutely is doing the worst English accent I've ever seen. It's fucking awful. And, it, it, the whole thing for me is just a shit show, and, and especially Anakin at the end when he like he's playing a fucking video game, like he's in the arcade playing, a, and he's like, oh, you know, and he's there with R two. And what I don't understand, sorry, if I'm really on it now, I'm proper gone. Is <laughs> go for it, Chris. C three PO and R two D two a fucking Anakin's droids, <laughs> yeah. right? But Darth Vader just fucking don't even acknowledge them. There's no continuity whatsoever, even. When I watched Avenger the Sith, I don't know we'll get on to it. I was like, for fuck's sake, someone acknowledge that they were your droid, you fucking knobhead. You know, I was proper. There were so many continuity problems with this film. I was like, George Lucas just simply don't give a fuck what people think. He really don't. And it, it it's an abomination of a film, which I genuinely thought, watching it again, and I think I watched it about 18 months ago, I thought, you know, build up to, to Rise of Skywalker, this is going to be great watching this again. And it's simply not. And the way they try and flesh all the stuff out, I like the feel of the original New Hope and that because it feels barren. It feels mm-hmm. like the rebels are having to sort of hide in little, like on the Hoff and that, they have to hide. And then at the end of Return of the Jedi, he puts all that shit in like these these worlds and, and planets all over celebrating. And it doesn't feel like that when I first seen one because of the budget, you couldn't expand the universe. But watching this, I was just like... This is fucking... T- and when that little knobhead at the end gets the <laughs> droid and he gets stuck to his foot and he starts <laughs> killing them all, I was like, oh... You-. And, and that guy, I said to Dave, I've been, I've, this, I've had pent-up progression by this, by the way, as you can tell. <laughs> it's when the guy, one of his Gungan, whatever he's called, mate, says to Jar Jar, and I was like, George Lucas, you should be ashamed of yourself. He went, 
Jaja, you in doo-doo. And I was like, <laughs> oh, my yeah. fucking God. That is absolutely <laughs> shit. It is shit on top of shit. So anyway, that's my I'll rant. Take- I've been waiting for that. I was going to quickly say, no, but... one thing with the dialogue, what I want to say with uh, Jar Jar, what it sounds like with Jar Jar's dialogue is obviously George Lucas trying to make it appear to a child, but it actually sounds like it's more a child trying to write dialogue for an adult. Yes. It's, yeah. it's really weird. Yeah. And it's like, this isn't for anyone. I remember when I was a kid, I never liked Jar Jar Binks. And then as an adult, it's like, oh no, I fucking hate Jar Jar Binks. <laughs> um, and just quickly before I forget, checked online, Darth Maul, total screen time in Phantom Menace, six minutes, just under oh. six minutes. Ooh, How ooh, about ooh. that? I was wrong. I was, I was over. I over by half. But there you go. Sorry. <laughs> no, it's good that's that, a nitpick that backfired, isn't it? <laughs> I mean, it made it worse, didn't it? <laughs> Jesus. Nick Park, though. They've got Nick, it's, it's Nick Park, isn't it? Who plays Ray Parks? It? Ray, Ray Parks, Park, but the Park. voice is the the guy who's <laughs> in Run Fat Boy Run. <laughs> yeah, because Nick Park's in Wallace yeah. and Gromit. Ray Park. Ray Park had a real sort of like he was for a hot minute. You know, there was like this, and then he did X Men, yeah. didn't he? He was Toad and X Men. Yeah. yeah. Like he was the thing for a bit, but uh, you know, Darth Maul, like six minutes of screen time, he was a stuntman and sort of martial artist and all this other stuff. Like he can't have been paid much for his screen time. All his money must have come from likeness rights, because after this, he he, I remember the Darth Maul toys that and Darth Maul appeared on all the uh, the toy packaging and like, you know, it was all that stuff. It was all over the place. So six minutes paid off that really must have paid off big time for i think him. it's it's just mm. another example of where lucas just doesn't really understand what he creates sometimes and how it's going to be received <laughs> you know because there you could say if you took that in isolation you would say you know less is more and it kind of mirrors darth vader in a new hope doesn't it yes. you know less mm. is more in that movie and Boba Fett. And Boba Fett, absolutely. Yeah. But but when you see, you know, like Jar Jar, it's like, nope, nope, not, not less is more. <laughs> more is more. <laughs> <laughs> Faster with more intensity. It's, you know, but I, I want to sort of talk about what Chris said about uh, Qui-Gon and um, uh, Obi-Wan in this film as well. So throughout the original trilogy, like, you know, the, the, the Jedi remain mysterious. Like, you know, their sort of <clears throat> place in the wider sort of uh, galactic culture and sort of society is, is remains a little bit of a mystery, but it's always sort of, I always took it that they were like um, intergalactic Buddhist monks, mm-hmm. you know, they sort of like they existed and they were warrior monks. They probably existed in the temple, but they were just sort of out there in the sort of ether and that sort of thing, you know, sat meditating on the force or whatever in this film. It's alluded to in every film, in pretty much every film it comes up. They are, basically the bully boys of the republic yeah they're the hide mm. muscle aren't they <laughs> literally yeah exactly like in this, this film starts where the republic's the senate's gone oh well they went they're not listening to us so do you know what we're going to send a couple of jedis in uh to nego to negotiate for us <laughs> And when, and when you see the sort of the viceroy and stuff, and he he finds out they're jedi he shits his pants a bit and then but and at first you're like oh it's a bit of an overreaction maybe their response when they hear the, their first response, they've been waiting for some time, but they hear a noise, and what's the first thing they do? They whap out their lightsabers. <laughs> <laughs> These guys have got no fear of just going. All oh, right, someone's not. Well, we're going to kill someone then. It, the negotiations just, just, were short. <laughs> yeah, it just because you killed everyone. It just, it, I don't know. It, I, this film started to really to worry me the moment that. You find out that basically they yeah they are the sort of the enforcers of the Senate, and I even recognised that when I was younger. I was like, yeah, this doesn't sit well with me at all. I don't know what I was saying. So you know, maybe I'm reading it wrong, but no, I, no, don't. I, 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 sorry, I see what you mean. Yeah, it, it, I'm sorry. It's um no, I I get what you're saying. It is one of those things where as you, it's a very focal point of what's going to be with this. Uh, what we talk about in this one compared to the last chat is just that George Lucas even though he was in air, essentially the mastermind behind obviously the originals given all the people involved he then was like cool i can do literally anything i want untethered got no one telling me what i can and can't do i can write all this crap dialogue and have these weird characters in but the one thing you'd think that someone like george lucas would have actually made sure of is continuity just from hearing him talk and in interviews and the way he kind of generally is i assumed he'd be quite anal about really specific small things and then you watch mm. these films and you're like 
did he? Uh, I think one of you guys said in the last podcast, like, did, did they? Did he even rewatch his own films when he made the prequels? Did he just go, nah, I remember all the details. I don't even need to look over the script. How many Jedi were there? Ten thousand. What? And in twenty years, all of them died, except part for yeah. like one percent, and everyone forgot about them. Ten thousand people in the middle of literally the capital city of the entire planet of Coruscant, in which is the entire capital city of the whole system and the whole world, the whole like universe knows Coruscant is a central point. There's a Jedi temple on the central point of the whole world with 10,000 <laughs> Jedi wandering in and out of it and in 20 years everyone was like oh yeah did Jedi exist so like, what yeah yeah Mr. Yeah, Darth Vader and your ancient religion yeah. like, <laughs> no 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 it's not <laughs> um, the thing is like I say this is what makes me laugh about these these I mean Chris you say about the continuity like, the continuity is out the window like yeah no matter what we talked in the last episode about what order to watch these in, and we sort of mentioned about do you watch the prequels first or the original trilogy, that sort of thing. It doesn't matter because, like you say, continuity is so screwed up. And I hate, I absolutely hate and detest the fact that not only are C-3PO and R2-D2 Anakin's droids, he fucking built C-3PO. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. No, and, no, and he thought it, of everything what? though, didn't he? Because at the end of the trilogy, he wiped <laughs> C-3PO's memory. Like, that's what I was going to say, because <laughs> I look the, I, I remember sort of like, and again, Mike, you'd said it, and you know, oh, you know, you said sort of like, well, you know, Sith is probably the best of the three. Yeah, it is. But the bar is so bleeding low <laughs> that it's like, but the, there's a, you get to Revenge of the Sith, and you're like, oh, okay, now everyone's basically got to be put in a position to be ready for a new hope. And there's so much that they need to explain, and they sort of explain a lot of it in the last sort of like 15 yeah. minutes. And it's just, <laughs> oh, it's, it's so irritating but yeah this film is just all over the place like there's no need for either C- i mean c-3po is actually um he comes he comes he's actually obi-wan's droid isn't he like he actually comes to tatooine or is he actually don't recall uh, no, only a droid no, <laughs> no what happens what, what happens yeah, yeah. Al- alzheimer's yeah. <laughs> What well, what happens is um, C three PO. Um, I want to clarify also. This is something that doesn't get explained properly. I only found this out a little while ago. Apparently, Anakin didn't build C three PO from scratch, which was what I, which is what the films all allude to. Apparently, he mm. found like a really broken droid and then repaired it so much it's like he created him new which is that is not the fucking same <laughs> as creating a droid and when you realize what the problem is is that when you get to the original trilogy or um, some of the later uh, ones you notice protocol droids but they're not gold they're silver mm. and that's the mm. difference that's how you could point out c3po but he basically was um he went to the the owen and thingamajiggy the, the the people are on tatooine for a while between episode one and two because he because he, anakin leaves him there doesn't he with shmi mm. and then he goes with owen lars's dad or whatever and then Anakin yeah picks him up after he finds his dead mom in the second one that and was then, so, i'm just, just just that was the thing that really bothered me you know you said like yeah c3po oh, is actually i was gonna say dave's just gone yeah oh we'll, be back. we'll carry on okay sorry um, well, no, let's, let's hold it for a minute because I have a really good point. <laughs> I really want to hear it as well. I'm really sorry for talking. As soon as I watch him dispel, I was like, oh no, do I say, oh God. <laughs> I have to make a little note down somewhere, like 27 minutes, just, <laughs> just cut a chunk out. Yeah. Is he calling you, Chris? No, no, no. Um, I'm open. Yeah, he's probably, he's probably chatting away. He probably thinks we've all disappeared. <laughs> Could have come in. Is, is he, what did he call himself? Dave. Dave Binks. He's probably just supposed to change his name. <laughs> yeah, there he is. is. Oh, I was there hoping is. you. Were, yeah, yeah I was hoping you were just going to carry not active on. Active at the moment. <laughs> said it's. It's. If you can hear us, Dave, your mic is muted. Or yep, seemingly. Sorry, I was just going to say. Uh, I was hoping you you'd back. just carry on because uh, this happened last time, didn't it? So. Uh, just, yeah. just carry yeah, on, and I'll just be doing. quiet for that bit if it happens again. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um. Yeah, so the point I was going to make is, yeah, you mentioned about um, C-3PO being given to um, Uncle Lars as Aunt 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 Beru between sort of episode one and two. And in that, is he gold or is he any particular colour? No, he's like a bronzy, like dirty bronze colour. He's a dirty bronze, but it's still notably C-3PO, okay? Mm, But but later on, in in A New Hope, at no point, like I know they've wiped... um, I know they've wiped C-3PO's mind, that sort of thing. But at no point does Lars or Beru go, that, that droid seems really familiar. Did he not stay with us at one point? <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's a very <laughs> good point. That's a great point. It, it can't yeah, possibly be either. the same one because he doesn't know the, uh, yeah, the language of Bachi. 
<laughs> no, and I also got to say, considering that this film, you know, when you do meet Lars and uh, Uncle Lars and, and Brew in the second in episode two, but the the gap between episode two and episode three is a couple of years. But then let's say it's twenty three years between episode two and the New Hope, just sort of around that twenty three, mm. twenty five years. They have aged really <laughs> badly in that twenty five well, you know, years. Moist, so did Obi Wan. Is is a hard yeah, business. So it <laughs> So it, it tells me, yeah, like, yeah, Tatooine really must have, they must have get really bad skin damage from living on Tatooine. Um, but the point was to me is, it, yeah, you mentioned, and we are jumping all over the place, that they wipe C3PO's mind at, uh, you know, they say, always wipe, wipe the thing from C3PO. They don't do R2D2. Yeah. So does that mean that R2D2, because obviously, you know, R2D2 obviously goes off and there's all stuff between three and four. Hmm. At the start of four, like, C- R2D2 knows everything. Mm-hmm. R two D two. So he knows. He's laughing his ass off, <laughs> especially yeah, when basically. Leia gives Luke a big kiss. He's like, "Oh, you just wait." Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's when you hear it. That going. Yeah. <laughs> Egging him on. <laughs> That's it. Yeah. But like you say, like you know, R two D two. At no point again when they return to Tatooine, or when he goes to like, because um, they can all seem to understand him. When mm. they go back to uh, uh, Tatooine and and. Uh, Obi Wan says, "I don't recall owning a droid." He'd be like, "Wait a minute, <laughs> what do you mean? Like you owned me for almost two decades?" <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, also, what makes it worse is there's the. the I won't go too deep into this because most people listening won't have known this much about it. But the Clone Wars series, just briefly, in that Anakin's connection with R two is so intense, like he's literally with him the entire time, and Obi Wan is with Anakin pretty much the entire time calling him r2 like even episode three they have this thing where you know they're jumping all over the place again but at the start of episode three in the land of grievous ship obi-wan is like oh um you know you got to watch out for r2 his circuits are going or something like that and him and anakin have a little bit of a back and forth about anakin defending r2 saying he's doing his best and obi-wan saying he's getting a bit old or whatever but then what's it you literally as you say like these five six seven years of going to war with a little blue droid called r2 who's yeah. clearly got way more stuff than any astrotech has ever got i don't think i've ever seen an astromech droid set, like spray oil over two battle droids <laughs> light them on fire with a jetpack and fly away <laughs> and then it's like nah, i never owned any droids so not even yeah. this looks a little bit familiar or i knew a lot of droids but yeah i might recognize this one just the <laughs> never owned a droid <laughs> fuck yeah, off it's fucking yeah. nonsense. I, I do agree it's- and I, sorry Scott, no, I was going to say, I was going to go for it. Go on. No, no. What one other thing that really, really pisses me off in in these whole prequels is who actually thought that nobody in the audience forget that they're all fucking stupid in this prequel and nobody <laughs> realised who who anybody is. <laughs> who in the audience was actually going to the cinema and thinking, you know what? Doesn't he sound like the Emperor that fucking um, <laughs> team? Doesn't he sound like him? Because as soon as I saw it, I went, that's the Emperor. I was like, mm. he, I just thought from the get-go, he should have been somebody completely different, as in he was just sort of shape-shifting or whatever into another character. Because it's fucking ridiculous. Through the whole of the movies, you can clearly see, and all you sat there waiting for, and I remember watching thinking, one, when is he going to change into the Emperor? It's obvious it's him. The same voice. He doesn't even change his accent or fuck all. He just does the same. And I'm like, what was George Lucas even thinking? It just absolutely, to me, it just makes no sense whatsoever that it really, really pisses me off more than Jar Jar Binks, to be honest. Well, it's funny you say that because even with like, a ref- rev- I want to clarify anyone to say, if I keep referencing uh, my girlfriend watching it, it's because I'm obviously a huge Star Wars nerd. She didn't really see them in, like all at once before seeing me. She'd seen like Phantom Menace once and like episode four and five maybe so when i refer to her it's more like someone with a new lens like someone of you know 2019 2018 <laughs> watching all the stars films and she said in the first one in phantom menace she was like that guy's a baddie isn't he and, and i was like yeah. i was like you, i was like i'm not gonna i said to her before we watched all the films i was like if you ask me any questions to do with the plot i'm gonna say i'm not giving you an answer every single time <laughs> and she was like i know it is she, like within the minutes of being on screen she's like, i know it is and she hadn't even that was the point where she hadn't seen episode four or five since she was about nine or something and she was like no it definitely is not only is it that i kind of recognize him but he also keeps doing these like really ominous things i mean in episode three he does um like a dramatic head turn when he's talking to um, yeah. him, like five or six times. And you're like, you're the least subtle person ever. And he's the only character in the whole of the prequels, apart from Padme, who isn't some sort of, in air quotes, major person who suddenly is. Do you know what I mean? Like all of them are Jedi or they're all soldiers or they're really close connections with some of the characters. But Palpatine doesn't really have that very much, but he's just in it a lot. And you're like, 
even if you don't recognize the actor, you know he's got to be doing something. So it's completely, as you say, Scott, it's just like, was it even a twist? With, does George Lucas actually think it was a twist? I really hope he doesn't. I really, no, he really... He honestly, really? <laughs> yeah. so oh, he honestly God. Believed, he honestly believed that they, they, until they, re- they refer to him as Palpatine, and also like, you obviously know, if you've seen the originals, like, they refer to him as, as, as Senator Palpatine. Um, you know, you go, oh, it was Emperor Palpatine, so you sort of know. But it's supposed to be a bit of a surprise. And so, yeah, even if you've never seen the original, if you were to watch these in order, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, whatever, he's, it's so sort of, it's, yeah, it's so set up that you watch him and you're like, well, you're clearly the buddy. Yeah. <laughs> you're, I... you're clearly. You're clearly playing the system. I'm not sure he can yeah. really have believed it was. It would be a massive surprise because at the end of Phantom Menace, it is such a big wink to the camera when he says to Anakin, <laughs> "You know, we all know this is a primarily a story about you know how does Anakin Skywalker become Darth Vader," and he says to him at the end, "You know, we shall." keep an eye on your career and then i'm sure it doesn't mm. even the emperor music start playing and then the camera basically zooms into him i mean it's he only winks yeah at the it's, it's not like <laughs> westworld is it or or the recent watchman that's come out there's no there's no subtlety and mm. really digging deep to find out the you know the conspiracy no. theories it was a massive well, wink the thing the thing is ian it was it how do you say it? ian mcdermott yeah, mcdermott yeah. or something like that as as the as the films get on, I mean, in the first one, he reminds me. I don't, you know, um, I don't know if you've, any of you have seen this. There was a program called uh, Yes Minister and Yes Prime Minister from the oh, yeah, like yeah, yeah. 80s. Big fan. I love that show. I used to love that show, and I still watch it quite a bit now. But there was an actor called Paul Eddington uh, who played oh, the minister, mean, yeah. and um, and uh, yeah, and eventually the prime minister. And he looks like him, so I can see that he's sort of playing him as a sort of a, a bit of a you know a bureaucrat and a sort of politician in the first one. I, I always get that feel from him, that Paul Eddington sort of feel. So I can sort of get it in the first one. I'm like, okay, well he's clearly set up to be the baddie, but I can see he's trying to play it down, and you know, there's little bits and pieces. So when he is the baddie, he's trying to play it differently. By the second and third one, though, it's out the window, <laughs> like. He's basically gone to pantomime school, and he's like, "No, no, now I'm the baddie." <laughs> and if I had a twir- if I had a mustache, I would twirl it. It's it just gets yeah. more and more ridiculous until, like you say, the third one and that infamous scene where they're sat at the the bubbly water opera. And if you if you did if you weren't able to ever guess, and this tells me how stupid some of the Jedi are. Um, when he sits there and he's like, "Have there has anyone ever told you the story of?" Darth Plagueis, <laughs> and he's like, no, no, what's that? He says, oh, he was the most evil Sith ever. Like, so how do you know about this? <laughs> yeah, Jedi yeah. Have ever <laughs> That's really suspicious. No, no, it's not. Yeah, <laughs> it is. It's ridiculous. <laughs> the Jedi are it the is biggest ridiculous. blaggers, aren't they? Because they don't know shit. Even when, and, and again, jumping around, so I'm going to go to um, Attack of the Clones, and when. You know, Shmi, so Anakin's mum, is captured. You know, she's uh, tortured to the point of death. And then Yoda's like, hmm, in tremendous pain, Anakin mm. is. And it's like, well, maybe have a chat to him when he comes back. Nah, it's just, we'll yeah. ignore that. I'm sure he'll be fine. <laughs> you're, you're totally right. There was, it's, it's funny you said it, because that was the one that struck me this time. Was there, so he, the obviously. Yoda's response is because he, he obviously kills all the sand people, doesn't he? So he you know he actually admits it later on. He killed them, the men, the women, and yep. the children. But when you see him sort of step out of that, so he sees his mother and she's been tortured and she's she dies in his arms. He steps out of that that sort of sand person's tent and he just lights the lightsaber and then you just hear the screaming. You just sort of see Yoda sort of like you know and he sort of goes mm, and he's obviously sensing something in the force. But at no point does anyone sit down, because they obviously know about his mother, and go, would you like some grief counselling? <laughs> You've clearly got some issues. I think we'd like to deal, you know, help you deal with them, because that's what the Force is for, to help you sort of reach a balance. Nope. It's basically a case of repress it. That's what you should do. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and I'm also admit, you, you do try and redeem yourself, because obviously, if you go into Attack of the Close of that, I, I do like Hayden Christian as Anakin. I just think because you McGregor is so poor in these first two, I- I'm going to get to Vengeance here, but I think in these first two, he's awful. He really is bad. And the way he's like, um, 
you know, he's uh, t- 10 years into it between the Phantom Menace and Attack of the Clones and stuff. And, and it's the way they're together. They're so, there's just nothing about them. There's no chemistry that I can actually believe that he spent 10 years training under this guy. I think he's just spent 10 years being really, really um, pent up and aggressive. And that's exactly why I think to Darth Vader, thought, you know what, this boring fucker, I'm not even dealing with him anymore. <laughs> I'm off because no matter what he does, he's either got Obi-Wan or he's got fucking Samuel L. Jackson there giving him the once over. And every time (laughs) Anakin wants to do something, he's just fucking going, no, you stay there. There's no reason for him to say that other than the fact that they're trying to make it look that Anakin's just pent up with aggression. It makes no sense whatsoever, the the, the dynamics of that relationship. And, And also what I love is... Kim Padme through the whole thing. In each film, we get a totally different character that Natalie Portman is playing. <laughs> Every film she plays completely. She, she might be called the same, but it's just ridiculous. And especially in the third one, when she's this loved up like teenager, oh, yeah. it's mm. absolutely ridiculous. But what I found that bit odd in, in Attack of the Clones, if we moved on to that, is when she's in bed and they're trying to stop this assassination, and, and Obi Wan goes, "You're using her as bait, aren't you?" And then the next minute, these slivery weird snaky things come in or caterpillars, whatever they are, come to get her. And then Obi-Wan just decides to jump through a window, which is totally out of character from the whole of the stealth. Phantom Menace and the other Can one. Can I just say it's as just... well, stealth caterpillars? Because when R2-D2 Sorry, Dave, wakes yeah. up, they, they hide from him. And I'm like, hang about. <laughs> you know? Yeah, I know. It's fucking ridiculous. But it's the way Obi-Wan, completely out of character, just takes a Tom Daly out of the window, doesn't he? And just goes after that, that thing that's tried to kill her. It's just, it's you absolutely say, ridiculous. Chris, you say out of character. What I would say is, he hasn't, at this point, he has no character. <laughs> Because, like you say, he's completely bland in the first film. Like, he's a non-event. Like, you know, he, yeah. he obviously, <clears throat> he's sat there because they're like, right, okay, well, we need uh, Obi-Wan because he's got to be in the, at least the third one. So we'll have him and we'll make him better in the later ones. But he's just sort of there. <laughs> you know, they just sort of like, every now and then he does one thing. But it's it's more about Qui-Gon, isn't it? Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it um, is. so, yeah. He's a complete non-event in the first film. So, but you, I would say he's inconsistent in... Um, in the second one, because they do things like I say, when that chase happens, um, he's just d- dove out of a window, as you say, to grab hold of the sort of the droid, the flying droid. And then later on, obviously he falls into the flying car thing. And then later on, Anakin jumps out the car. <laughs> he says, well, I hate it when he does that. And I'm like, <laughs> you, you just, just did that out of a window. <laughs> 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 but it reminds me of, but surely Jedi it reminds- can't fly. I mean, you know, <laughs> Again, in the it's not it's falling with style. the original. <laughs> you know, they they're just enhanced, aren't they? And they can tap into the force and yeah. use it. They can't just jump out of a Blade Runner style skyscraper and just have confidence they'll they'll be all right. You know, there's got to be a little bit of self preservation about them. I I just found I I really didn't like this this particular scene at no. all. I, I just want to add one last thing. And when Anakin's driving that car. It just remind me of Back to the Future 2 when Doc Brown comes down and takes Marty to the future and he's going, we're getting a taxi cab to um, Hill Valley, uh, to Hillvale, wherever he lives, ends up living Marty. And I'm like, this is rubbish. It just reminded me of Back to the Future. I was just waiting for the, the shark to come out somewhere, <laughs> yeah. Jaws 22 or something. <laughs> it's really bad. <laughs> it's, it's, it is. I mean, you, you're right. The one thing I want to sort of pull back on is Padme. Is, mm-hmm. Yeah. They try to build up all the other characters, and and you know this is this is a trilogy, so their story arc sort of travels over the three films, and so you get sort of um, <clears throat> as you said, Hayden Christensen as Anakin Skywalker becoming an emo petulant prick, <laughs> um, you know. And but let's be fair, the other thing I want to point out about Hayden Christensen, you know, we see about Ian McDermott being the Emperor being clearly a mm-hmm. baddie, right? When you watch all the other Jedi, so whether it be Qui-Gon through to Obi-Wan through to Mace Windu or any of the others, their uniform is like a light brown, like a beige kind of khaki towel effect kind of thing, right? Going on, yeah? Mm. Anakin is wearing like dark browns and blacks <laughs> and leather. and everything. I and always no thought that. Yeah, and it's like... Is it like oh he's going through a, he's going through an emo phase? We'll let it slide. It'll, it'll, it'll grow out of it. But like it just continues. It's almost like George Lucas wants to hammer home like you know he is a buddy. He is a buddy, and it's like he, there's like you said, Dave. There's no subtlety to this at all. 
Um, and it just drives me at the wall because Padme does the same thing. She starts as a really sort of intelligent, strategic. I mean, she's supposed to be sort of a, a, an older teen or mid teen in the first one. So you sort of, you know, but she's a really a dynamic character. She's thoughtful. She's brave. And in the second one, she sort of she becomes willful and, you know, a little bit more irritating, but she's still dynamic and has agency and all this other stuff. And you think, oh, wow, Padme's story in this is going to be really tragic. In the set, in the third one, she's just she's sort of just there, yeah. Mm. And like all that di- all that agency and all that diamondism is gone. Like she just sort of like moons around, sort of like, yeah. Well, I'm pregnant now, so now I'm going to be a woman. I'm going to be a mother. George Lucas just she he ruins that character because she starts off so well, and it's clear that they're trying to say, look, this is Leia's mother. This is why Princess Leia she's you know, Leia is much like her mother, but it just. Yeah, I felt there was mixed signals. I, I mean, I must admit, I, I think Natalie Portman's dialing this in, but she's not the only one. But in the second yeah. one, where they're in that, that pit, you know, when uh, they've been captured mm. by Dooku and, and the Trade Federation. On Geonosis. Yeah, and, mm. and they're showing her, you know, so you've got Anakin and you've got um, Obi-Wan and they're tied up and she's already, you know, she's off, she's already escaping. But She's wearing, you know, something from the George Lucas costume school, isn't she? You know, and and she gets a little <laughs> swipe, and it just makes her outfit a bit sexier. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I just thought, come on, is, are you playing up that she's this really strong, independent woman, or you know, is she something to ogle at? Which also a problem is with this now. Now I've only the first time I've chimed in a few minutes, and that's going to be the worst thing ever. Is that you can actually see her nipples in Attack of the Clones? Oh, so she's that is as yeah, subtle it, as the Emperor in the first one. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, she just wears complete white, and then the only thing that has any color on her is obviously her nipples. And you're like, I, was, I remember I saw when I watched it with uh, Megan. She was like. There's Natalie Portman's nipples, and I was like, I, I, I yes, <laughs> I think they are. She was like, where, what, what? I thought, what? Why is that happening there? I was like, I, I, I don't really know. Like, there's not really a reason why she would not wear something underneath that or anything. Is oh, but then this, again, I know this, Star Wars. I know this. George Lucas told Carrie Fisher that there are no bras in space. <laughs> I was about to bring up the Carrie Fisher thing. I was like, what? Yeah. what? Yeah, because in, in the first one. That sounds like a Jimmy in... Savile line, quite honestly. But <laughs> yeah, yeah. 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 in the background, Gary Glitter was playing. But yeah, no, when they're in, when in the New Hope, they're in the trash thing of the Death Star. And you can clearly see she's got no bra on. And it's literally a wet mm. t shirt. There's one clip of that. It's like a wet t shirt competition. I may have uh, stopped it a few times in my youth. <laughs> and, you know, but anyway, yeah. But, but yeah, I, I agree. I, I've never seen that bit, Mike. I'm going to have to go back for research. It's when. <laughs> It's specifically when they're in, um, for you uh, fellow pervs out there, or men as we call them, um, when you're on uh, on Tatooine and they're in the ship and he's basically, Anakin's arguing with Padme about, you know, whether or not they should go. And she's like, oh, well, you need to protect me and I'm going this way. And he's like, okay, well, that that's when you can see the, the most. But I don't want this to be a thing of, let's talk about the nipples in Star Wars. Anakin, cause... stop oh. turning the air con down. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> using his force powers to sort of turn yeah. the switch down yeah. <laughs> now, can, can I propose a question to Mike actually Scott because mm. obviously Mike you, you have a great knowledge of history oh god with the, the Star Wars no no and, and I may have missed the dialogue in this because pr- probably a, a few times I was either out of the room making a brew or I was just literally had my head in my hands going what the fuck are wasting <laughs> cars I'm alive for but you know obviously Obi-Wan gets Luke and literally Luke just becomes a Jedi on the chessboard of the Millennium Falcon, doesn't he? He literally just puts <laughs> a fucking helmet on him and says, close your eyes, feel it, and all that nonsense, and he becomes mm. a Jedi. And even though we, we love a new open that. When Qui-Gon actually presents Anakin to, to the Jedi Council, they say he's too old. Now, he's obviously about seven, isn't he, in this, or eight? I but, think he, yeah, I think he's eight or ten. Yeah, eight or ten. But Luke... All bets are off. I know we've literally, the Jedi is just, you know, we know by the end of Revenge of the Sith, the Jedi is just falling off a cliff and literally <laughs> they're fucked, basically. Um, but nobody, I know he's not got to present him to him, but he doesn't really say to him, you're too, you know, you're too old, Luke. It's just, oh, again, a continuity thing. He, he did an oh, empire, did he? didn't he? You're too, too mm-hmm. old yeah. when he's talking to um, Obi-Wan. Obi-Wan. It, yeah. No, but I mean, Obi-Wan never said it. That's what I, I found really bizarre. 
Yeah, well, Obi Wan um, in one of the series styles Rebels. Obviously, in, in in the prequels, the whole thing is Anakin's the chosen one. That's like a big Jesusy thing, uh, and that's why they kind of get let him get away with everything. Um, and then in Rebels, um, Obi Wan is asked about it. I won't spoil what happened in it, but he basically is asked about luke and he says oh he's the chosen one he's going to bring balance to the force so he thinks that luke's the chosen one so he'll just kind of go along with it but also a little point here is the prequel time jedi they are as you guys have pointed out they're so arrogant and they're so like they have the emperor under their nose and <clears throat> obi-wan and yoda briefly touch upon this in the films but uh, in the in a couple of series they talk about it a bit more depth but it's like they specifically had to kind of change their ways a bit. And Yoda does kind of say a bit on Dagobah where he was like, essentially the way we used to do things is wrong because we used to blanket say, you know, this person's too young. You don't talk about the dark side. It was it's the equivalent of basically being celibate now. It's like, if you go to any, it's like basically saying, don't say bad things. Don't think bad things. Just don't do bad things. And when, you know, Yoda and Anakin talk in Revenge of the Sith and Anakin's like, I've been having these bad dreams. I'm really freaking out. I'm getting really close to, you know, bad stuff. And Yoda goes, oh, uh, whoever dies, just learn to basically deal with it. And it's like, <laughs> that is not helpful. That's why, that's one of the reasons why, and that's why obviously Yoda says he failed and all that sort of other stuff because they kind of, very subtly ironically touch upon how they kind of do realize they've done wrong and they have to kind of change the way they're doing things but it is that whole prequel jedi they're so arrogant and they're so thinking now we've been jedi we've had peace from the sith for like a thousand years or whatever so you know they can't ever come back ever no don't worry about that although we are going to put these really random weird restrictions on our children not really talk about it and just repress the shit out of them and then just hope (laughs) nothing bad happens (laughs) <laughs> yeah. I don't know if any of you, I don't know if any of you have seen uh, the musical Book of Mormon. Or oh, the yeah. oh yes, yep. love it. There's, there's, a, there's a song in that called "Switch It Off," which is <laughs> yes. all about that. Which is about like, turn it off. But, you know, yeah. it's about repressing your thoughts and just not thinking about it. And that's just yeah, it's sort of like it's the book of uh, the book of the wills. Basically, is now what it is. It's just, that's what they do. They just turn it off. <laughs> um, I think. Oh, sorry, it, go on. I just go on. I was gonna say, I just, I totally agree that the Jedi in these films are, they, they are, you know, I struggle to see them as the good guys throughout because of that arrogance, especially people like Mace Windu as well. That like mm. they never come across as, um, you know, as benevolent or thought. They are just sort of like these bully boys and this arrogance of the Jedi Council that continually comes through, and more so in um, two as well through the Clone mm. Wars, mm. As, and and in three as well, when they keep making these decisions, these arbitrary decisions, like in two, you find out that a previous Jedi has just gone off and ordered the creation of a clone army. <laughs> yeah. And I'm like, well, firstly, who's paying for that? Cause that sounds expensive, but like who, what did he not sit down? That just seems like a really arrogant move. He's gone, well, I'm not going to talk to anybody about this, but secondly, no one in the Jedi has said, Oh, I sense a disturbance in the force. One of our own has gone off and ordered some, you know, it, it like they just can't all this crap they said they can sense they just seem can't in the in the prequels I, yeah i also, imagine oh go ahead no, go ahead sorry i imagine that a bounty hunter is pretty expensive and so yeah. you know it's not just to to grow this huge clone army but to actually just put up jango fett and his unaltered clone um boba fett you know that must be come with a hefty price so i don't i don't know you know when we talk about expensive you you are talking about the national debt kind of expensive there aren't you i mean it's absolutely huge and they are the worst the, those long neck things who mike probably knows the name of Camino they and... are the worst at reading people aren't they you know because obi-wan turns yeah. up and he's like uh oh we've been expecting you uh really you know <laughs> <laughs> it's clearly <laughs> I've no idea they're there and you know I don't know what one thing I just want to say as well like with the originals and and certainly going back and rewatching them and and that it had this authentic feel about it with all the practical effects and I just I think two really annoyed me even more than one because everything just looks so synthetic and fake mm. you know it looked shallow perfect polished but kind of you know you could tell it's not real and everyone's just running around with a massive green screen behind them and and it just i think that took me out of it more than anything mm. I, I, there's, there's a there's a scene in three um because you're right it's, it's that uncanny valley isn't it like it never feels 
Um, it never has any weight. Yeah. A lot of the environments, especially in two and three, don't have any weight or heft to them, so they feel fake. But there's a scene when um, I don't know where the hell they are, but they've they've. Um, I think it's when he's they've just saved um, the uh, Chancellor and they, they return him to Coruscant, and he, he goes off, and you have got Padme hiding in the shadows, and she comes out to speak to Anakin. Um, and they moon over each other, and they have some terrible, terrible lovey dovey dialogue. But everything around them looks like it's been taken out of like some PS2 cutscene. Oh, is that where <laughs> like, he's got that pair? And you know, no, that's later on. That's even oh, that's terrible yeah. as well. I know you mean when he, he floats yeah. it to her and stuff like in some, like yeah, it's it's just it looks dreadful. Like these films look better when, like you say, when they look a little bit more tactile. There are scenes that are just horrendous, where the the surfaces look plastic or fake or just not not even there in some cases. Yeah, it just looks dreadful. What about the, the whole ask platform that. game as well? When you got Padme and Anakin. Oh, <laughs> in, in two, two, in yeah. two. Oh, the droid factory. Yeah. Oh, that's yeah. terrible. That's terrible. Forgot about that, Dave. That is mm. proper. Uh, old school gaming that yeah it's it's really bad and the the fact that the the amount of coincidences and things that they just get away with just not getting killed or melted is ridiculous it it really is the end bit George Lucas again he should hold his head in shame for me because I was watching thinking this is fucking wank you know it really (laughs) is bad it really is bad I wanted to ask you guys, um, I was going to say with, um, I've got some opinions on episode two because I really voiced them. Yeah, I'm waiting for you guys to cool down. But um, <laughs> with, I want to know what your opinions are before I forget. In episode one, um, after, I think it's 2004, they remastered Phantom Menace and they changed Puppet Yoda to CGI Yoda. Mm-hmm. Now, I think I know what you're all going to feel about this and I think I'm going to feel opposite about it. But I, well, after rewatching them and seeing original, like Puppet Yoda in, uh, Puppet Yoda in the new one, you know, when he's a Force Ghost in Episode Eight, and also in the originals, I think he looks the best there. But when I see Episode One Pap- Puppet Yoda, he does not. I, in my opinion, he looks better CGI because that puppet doesn't. It doesn't look any almost anything like actual Yoda from Dagobah. And I know it's several years apart, but he but looks, looks so weird. Yeah, it he, looks unfinished. I yeah. agree. No, actually, looks like a I'm parody only... of himself. Yes. Yeah, it's um. No, I agree with that. It's it's fixing something that's that's terrible with something slightly less worse. Slightly, <laughs> do you know what I mean? It's something that's like okay, yeah. it's, it's it's still crap, but it's not as crap as the, the sort of the, the half finished puppet that they seem to have like yeah they used the first time. I remember that being a thing though. When they were doing it, they were like, "We're keeping some practical effects, and Yoda will still be a puppet." And when you see him on the screen for the first time, I'm like, "I really wish he wasn't." <laughs> <laughs> it's dreadful. It's, yeah, it's funny because I think Revenge of the Sith, as much as I absolutely say I'm not a fan of Yoda one bit, I don't mind him in Revenge of the Sith because he's CGI'd in, you know, with the, mm. the fight with the Emperor and stuff like that. I don't mind his character in in that one. But um, no, I've not really noticed that, to be honest, Mike. It's never, probably because I watched the dodgy copy originally, but <laughs> I, I generally never really noticed that. And as you know, I'm not a fan of Yoda anyway, so I probably just was rolling my eyes or something at that point. And I know that's sacrilege because what he is, he is the man in it. But you know what I have a problem with, guys? Right? And I love Star Wars. I, I genuinely do. I'm not just saying it. I've said it in the last one. I do love Star Wars. But I just find it really bizarre and almost, it's almost a fetish-like thing that they have to call each other master because you, it, I just think it, when I, I cringe when Anakin was saying to Obi-Wan, yes, master. And I'm like, but it just sounds fucking creepy. It sounds like some snuff film from the 70s or something. It just, it, to <laughs> me, it's just not right. It's just not right at all. It's in just... universe, it's kind of the equivalent of saying sir, in a, in a sense. It's kind yes, of that. I know. Yeah, I, agree. I, don't, I don't disagree that your opinion, obviously, I'm just saying in, in universe, calling any Jedi a master is kind of like calling... Yeah, a knight, sir. In, that's probably clearly the reason because Jedi knights and shit, and obviously there's a lot of British influence into uh, Star Wars things. But yeah, I think that was kind of the point. But I, I do get what you're saying. He just he, he, in the original, you know, I know they're the four, five, and six. Obviously, you don't get that because Obi Wan gets taken out within about half an hour of the start of the movie. But <laughs> but in this, I just find it really fucking creepy and bizarre that you've got Obi Wan saying to Qui Gon, 
yes, master. And then he's telling him something and he's going, you're right, master. Yes, yes. And I'm like, <laughs> have you got no fucking opinion of your own son? Do you know? And then when Anakin's saying it to Obi-Wan, it's ridiculous. And then Obi-Wan said, he's, he's like a brother to me. Is he fuck? He's not. <laughs> he's <just laughs> nonsense. It really, the only one they can call master is Yoda for me. <laughs> Everyone else is not a master. I'm sorry. I just, I'm proper shitting on it. I'm really sorry. But I, I genuinely, I'm watching it thinking, this is just fucking <laughs> weird and creepy. It's like a dom- dominatrix type situation all the way through in these three. It really is weird. <laughs> Lucas, I don't know what he's playing at. Well, I think he, the thing with Lucas is he was obviously going for, originally, he was sort of tapping into um, a lot of like samurai. Yeah. Uh, and Japanese Edo era sort of like mythology, wasn't it? That sort of thing of the sort of uh, that has a lot of um, master and servant kind of thing in that sort of thing. Unfortunately, as you say though, it sort of becomes so overdone that it starts to lose its meaning a little bit. Really, like you know, every it's a bit like you know, how easy is it to become a Jedi master? They make out it's really difficult, but it seems like everyone can do it. So it, yeah, yeah it's, it, well, it feels a bit not, like it has no not purpose. Everyone. Not everyone <laughs> that sits Anakin. on the council gets master. <laughs> yeah, Anakin, Anakin didn't. Yeah, and, and and I think you're right, Scott. I think I think yeah, I know it's a bit of a outrageous statement I've just made. Probably impresses a lot of Star Wars fans, but I, th- I think as well is the situation with Anakin. There was no logical reason for him not to be on the council other than to turn him into a heel, i.e., bad guy, it, because it was just. Samuel L. Jackson's character, what's it called? Mace, Mace Windu. Windu. What's Mace Windu, yeah. yeah. Windu, just being a cop, basically, isn't he? He's just yeah. got a be in his bonnet. And if, if they do have these feelings about Anakin, which obviously Yoda alludes to and this, this, this conflict in him and all this, then surely they shouldn't have carried on with his training. They should have said, hang on, this guy's a bad apple. Let's fucking... I know I'm really going over the top now because he's already done and dusted the movies and stuff, but it's just these loads of things staring him in the face. And like you said, Dave... The one thing I think, Dave, and I'm not just saying this because you are my tag team partner when it comes to podcasting, is what you said about Luke. And that's the one thing why the whole continuity thing goes out the window. It's the fact that it's like he doesn't know it's his fucking son, but his second name is Skywalker. <laughs> and that stuck with me <laughs> when we did it the other week. And I think I'm happy to mic drop it and go, you know what, Dave? I've got the fuck all else to say because that is the worst bit. Continu- oh, he's, he's living with. Um, brother and fa- uh, me, what is it? Me, me half brother and uh, his wife, you know, down on Tatooine, and he's called Skywalker. <laughs> what are the chances? You know, it's like, come on, it's absolutely nonsense. I just think, Dave, for me, that just made me chuckle because I'm like, yeah, there's, n- there's nothing to come back from. George Lucas was just sat with a, a room full of writers or yes men and yes women just going, yes, so that's a great idea, George. Devil's probably going for me. He's going <laughs> to bury- I don't think there was. Chris, I don't think there was a writer's room. If, if there was one person, he may have had a mirror in front of him. And just like, George, you said you've got a dick. Oh, well done, George. I want to pat myself on the back. That's, that's what I think it is. I think it's, there's nobody else involved in this. Because there's someone else, like you say, someone else would have just gone, this is crap. Yeah. Like, this is utter, as you, uh, the phrase you use a lot, I really like, is utter bobbins. Like, there is no like, yeah. sense to some of this. Because the one thing I'd say is, well, the, you know, I'm going to get into, I'm going to try and draw out a positive in a minute. But the other thing that really pisses me off about this <laughs> is, is, is the true. Just the, the, the way you said that, sorry, Scott. It's just the truth. Yeah. I'm going to get on the positive in a minute. But you know what really pisses me <laughs> off? Is that, okay, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to get through this. I'm going to get through this little anger moment to get to the positive. You know, in fact, you know, it's something that maybe if Anakin had done, he'd have probably been better off. But to work through this is this this desperate need he has to shoehorn in cameos of all these future characters so in the first one you get like uh jabba the huts there and obviously c-3po and r2d2 and you go okay you've got those fine and then they sort of in the second one they're like okay so okay we're now going to work in a character that's going to become leia's parents so we've got to have an organa in there so we'll make him up um, who else are we going to have in? Okay, well, then, eventually we're going to have Chewy bleeding appears out of nowhere <laughs> yeah. in the third one, and gives gives Yoda a piggyback, which you know, like, and he knows him. Yoda knows Chewy and refers to him as my old friend Chewy, and I'm just like, what? This is nonsense. And then it's just this constant need to sort of keep ref- referring to things, and then when 
I just I hate it so much because it's that thing. Like, so when they introduced in the second one, they introduced Lars and Baru and all this other stuff. And it's like, oh, they appear to be at least 21. They age really badly. Like, you haven't <laughs> thought this through. Why are they even here? Like, there's no purpose. Like, you know, you've come back to find your mum. This could have been easily he just went off to see his old his, what's his, what's, what was his old master called the, the guy who owned him as when he was a slave and oh. Otto. Right. Otto. Yep. And, Watto. Watto. Yeah, Watto. another terrible racial stereotype but let's not get into that but um yeah he could have easily like, he could have easily said oh yeah uh, he he uh, um she was off with this uh, with this you know person i sold or whatever but here recently she was taken by sam people she'll have been killed by now boom fine that could have been it, but they had to shoehorn in the rest of it, and it's just it, it's George Lucas sort of like, you know. Well, they don't seem to like the new stuff I'm doing, so I'm just going to force this other old crap down your throat just to remind you of why you seem to like this, th- these films, it's, it's and it one, just makes them worse. You know, working it's one of those... for Watto though didn't they were slaves, but it didn't really <laughs> seem that bad. I mean, they had their own place, you know, single mum, yeah, had her own pad there. It seemed to have plenty of space. Could have loads of guests in there. I, I didn't think it was too bad. <laughs> Fair enough. Well, it's, 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 it does, and when he came back, to be he's like, like trying to be... "Ooh, Annie," you know, he's he's sort of welcoming and stuff. So it, again, just awful for me. So sorry, Mike, I, I could cross you there. No, no, that's fine. Not a problem at all. What I was going to say with um, with a lot of sort of with the shoehorning in and things and a lot of what sort of Lucas was doing is one of the biggest problems I have with films that are prequels. Like obviously this is probably one of the big reasons everyone has problems with prequels now, but the problem is, is like one of the big things I love about the new trilogy is I don't know what's going to happen, you know, especially with last mm. Jedi without getting too much into that. It was very unexpected. All these things that happened, but plot has to be quite an important thing. And the problem is with the prequels, as you guys have kind of uh, said, I think Scott said as well, is well, like the first one is kind of you know, pottering around, there's not too much. And the second one, there's just, it's a bit weird. But then the third one, it gets like halfway through the film and then they go, oh shit, there were meant to be no Jedi. <laughs> well, okay. Let's solve every single problem in the space of about half an hour. And I love Revenge of the Sith. I want to clarify. It's a very, very flawed film. I do love it. But it's just like... With prequels, they write, especially George Lucas, to help himself. With a prequel, you have to be so careful and so specific about what you do and do not put in. You've got to make sure this, you've got to make sure that, all these sorts of different things. And then it almost seemed like the prequels were like almost better technology, almost had better this, everything looked a bit brighter and nicer. And I know the Empire being a part of it and things, but it's like, it just seemed really odd that they have all this Republic and the Clone Wars battles and there's a massive battle in the start of episode 3 and all the ships look amazing and crazy and then you go to the Emperor, the Empire and I know that TIE Fighters and stuff obviously they are really cool but they do look like downgrades which kind of it, it doesn't help with the, the trilogies all feel so different because they're all so they're, it's meant to be you know three eras of the, the Star Wars universe but it ends up just being this weird the middle one was like the perfect one the first one just went completely off the rails and now the newest one was way too safe and then way too off the rails it's like th- there's no with prequels you have to be so careful and he wasn't and now it's just kind of thrown all of them off you started off bad and then the second one was definitely not great and then the third one the big one which could have been incredible the actual the Jedi Purge one of my favourite things in all of Star Wars weirdly it's it's still lagged behind and held down by this crap love story and Padme being boring and Hayden Christensen. I don't blame him for being a bad actor necessarily in the second or third ones, but I just think the dialogue is so crap. It no mm. one can say those lines good, and it's <laughs> yeah. it's just so frustrating to me because I've I've had to watch these films. I had to. I've watched these films so many times. And I do genuinely love the prequels, but I can agree with you guys with all these points because. They are actually quite shit in a lot of ways, even though I enjoy them. And it really frustrates me because it's like, if someone just told George, other than George in the mirror, if someone just told him, please, can you dial it in a little bit or check over your notes a little bit more, (laughs) they could have been the coolest trilogy. They had the workings of some of the coolest trilogy. They just weren't. I think he was more focused, to be honest. I'd said to Chris um, last week, it, it feels like a tech demo, a lot of it to me. So I think he's got more wrapped up in all these cool things that they can do with this new technology. And, of course, you know, I, I only realized last week that he'd, he'd um, part of his, Lucasfilm, what was it, uh, Illumination and Magic, which is a division mm. of that, created the T-1000. And I just think mm, no. a lot of this was designed to just show, look at all the things we can do. You know, even in Phantom Menace, when you've got the droid army, 
at the time, this is 99, there, there was nothing like that. You know, getting so many moving, different moving parts and everything on the screen. And so I think he just was more focused on that and less on the story. And ultimately, you know, that's that's not what... That, that's for me why none of it stands up, really. No, I, I think for me, I've gone with you on this, Mike. I messaged Dave and Revenge of the Sith, I actually quite enjoy. Now, I think what I do enjoy about it is Obi-Wan has got a set of bollocks and has actually got a bit of attitude and a bit of character to... Obi Wan, and he's not just this absolute placid, you know, sort of conscientious objector to everything. He's actually giving something back, and I, I, I don't mind Revenge of the Sith. There's still some bad dialogue from you, McGregor. Don't get me wrong, but I, I think as a and and I think what you said before, Dave, is right. The bar is so fucking low. I think the best thing I could say probably about the three of these films is watch them and then watch the new open that because the new open that will just become masterpieces because <laughs> they are they're not they're not good films at all but i do think revenge of the sith is unfortunately it's the best of a bad bunch but but again there's stuff wrong in that there's stuff that's just going on and and, and natalie portman as we said before padme and you said scott it's ridiculous the whole and even you and mcgregor obi-wan his whole character and demeanor has changed i know it's a few years after he has to grow a beard to look slightly like alec guinness and that but my god they literally change everything it's like george duke's gone oh shit everyone's kicking off right i need to do this this and this and they just like 180 the characters that just the way obi-wan is portrayed in Avengers of the sith i wish he'd been like that all the way through because mm. it just felt like he had a bit of summit behind his character, whereas in the other ones, he was so vanilla, it's ridiculous. He really is boring. But in the in the end one, because he has to be a conclusion, there has to be a confrontation, he's fantastic. But again, <clears throat> I'm calling out, Dave, you're saying the CGI. The one thing that bugs me about Revenge of the Sith more than anything is that shit. Twilight fucking face the Emperor gets when he's fighting Yoda. <laughs> what is going on with that fucking <laughs> arse face he's got? That curtain thing. It's fucking rubbish. I'm sorry. That is absolutely shit on toast. It really is bad. And I'm watching it again, and every time I see it, I'm like, that is just terrible. It really is terrible. There's no reason for his face to bubble up like that. I know he's getting the, the finger thing and all that stuff with Yoda, Don't- but... Chris, Chris, yeah. there is a reason for it because that's what he looks like when he comes out in, in uh, the later films. <laughs> that's that's it. Yeah, it's it another is. one of those things where, like, because he, he it happens when he's fighting Mace Windu, isn't it? It happens when uh, Mace Windu tries to arrest him. Yeah, and he, he sort of says, you know, he says, oh, "I'm injured," and he says, sort of like, "Unlimited power," <laughs> like in his in his his emperor voice, and it's it's but like you say, it makes no sense. It's like, oh, so force lightning makes you go all like you said, ass face. It's, it's the, <laughs> the the only reason is because at some point in nineteen in the nineteen or oh, the early eighties, they've said, oh, wouldn't it be cool if the emperor looked like this? Yeah, that's it. Mm, that's yeah. it. He's yeah. got to look like an old man, and then they've, then they've come back and gone, oh crap! Now I've got to explain. Can I just it. Well, I, I, oh, I will... sorry, go on. Oh. I was going to actually explain it, unfortunately. Um, one of the reasons, apparently, uh, why that is, is because apparently that's actually what he was meant to always look like. But his normal smiley face politician is actually more of a like a dark side sort of mirage in a sense. Like he's kind of literally changing the way he looks because he's a lot older than he seems. And it's actually once he got electrocuted by himself, he couldn't hold up the whole... Oh, this is actually how I look like, sort of like this younger, less scary person. And then the force lightning brought out what he actually looks like. Because when you're really powerful on the dark side, apparently it literally corrupts your Mike, being. I'm, I'm going to stop yet. Yeah? I'm going to talk bullshit <laughs> on that. You can. You, I completely. I'm, uh, do you know? Do you know? Do you know how I could say that that was that could simply be explained? If that that could be true, I, I, I would ex- I would accept that as an explanation. If Every time the Emperor appears on one of the, or the or Darth Sidious, Darth Sidious appears on one of those hologram puck things, he looked like he had a melty face. Because mm. then I'm like, oh, when he's off in his own little quarters, he, you know, he has that melty face, but he doesn't. 
potentially so that makes no sense. it could be a thing of like i want to get this now this part, what i'm about to say now is me trying to explain it i do agree with you and i want to also clarify before i say this a lot of the problems that i said i think i said in the last episode as well is one of the biggest things that pisses me off about star wars is that there are so many things which could have easily been completely explained and sorted out mm-hmm. with one or maybe two lines of dialogue you've got so many pointless pithy scenes that are no need for it at all in attack of the clones you've got anakin and Padme running through the fields for ages and they're the boss i used to skip as a kid my tape i used to have on vhs it literally used to go weird and fuzzy right at the point where I used to fast forward it so frequently i wear down the actual uh the tape <laughs> itself because i used to love the end battle and things but it is so annoying where it's like there's so many bits in it which are just like if they just took a second to just actually explain things rather than just leave it really open and weird it would have made better i mean maybe this is now me speculating maybe with the whole darth sidious uh thing he it was like a sith magic which sounds like bullshit but it is in the series is like you do something and you permanently change the way you look but it can be broken now i do want to clarify if they said that in the film or something or they made some allusion to or did what you said scott it would make the film ten times better, make a lot more sense, and not sound like me trying to randomly scrounge for pieces on the floor, <laughs> desperately trying to defend it. Because I'm not like openly 100 percent agree with you. It's fucking stupid, <laughs> and he looks ridiculous. And my least favorite part of the whole of the first prequels, my least favorite part, it pissed me off so much, is and Megan pointed out when we watched it, is when the Emperor. He's so you know, regardless of how you feel about him, he's meant to be quite badass and all this sort of stuff. He's really evil, and then there's that bit where he's, he's about to kill Mace, and he goes, no, 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 you and I. <laughs> and it's like, oh, fuck off. No one talks like that. No, not even the most evil person on the planet. You, you sound like Yoda having a seizure. Fuck off. It's ridiculous. It's pissed me off so but much. I, I, but it, there's almost like, like for, the, for the actors, for Ian McDermott, like, it's almost like a trigger point, is it? Like, as he gets more pantomime, the moment he's allowed to be like a full uh, Sith Lord, He's like, right, now's my chance. I've had to be really restrained and sort of dignified for two and a half films. Now I'm going to go balls to the wall, ridiculous. So when you have the fight between him and Yoda in the uh, the Senate hall with all those pods and stuff, and he's like spinning one of them round and flying stuff around, and he's giggling like a schoolgirl. He's like, yeah, this is amazing, yay! It's, it, it makes him like more and more of a terrible character. This... This ominous figure of fear that existed in, you know, that all these sort of people in the Empire are terrified of in the original trilogy comes down to just some sort of like giggling, demented old bloke. It's just, it, it makes him co- become weaker in my mind and less of a, less of a sort of a threat. Yeah, really. more is more. I mean, what, what I was going to yeah. say is yeah. that I completely agree with all of that. And I just think I can't agree that Revenge of the Sith is actually good because it just feels to me that most of the movie is just table setting. It's just getting everything mm. in place for A New Hope. And and that's it. And it's uh, there's so many leaps of logic. But I am going to give it a little bit of credit now. So, and, and going back to what you were just saying there about when, when the Emperor essentially turns. And, and the irony, actually, that Windu gets chucked out the window... So, <laughs> when Windu is going to kill the Emperor, that doesn't seem very Jedi. And it's actually Anakin who's towing what more, you know, what the Jedi line should be. Surely they're not going full on Watchmen and becoming judge, judge and executioner. Well, that's actually the big thing that people say in uh, in Star Wars is actually one of the clever things that people don't necessarily realise. It's one that I watched this video on YouTube. It's called the, "Everything Good About Revenge of the Sith," essentially. Um, and one it's of the things short short <laughs> oh, you beat me too. <laughs> for that. Thanks, guys. Thanks, guys. Um, and um, essentially, what what they say is what, one interesting. When you watch in this video, it compares the scenes. It actually makes a lot more sense. It does actually make Revenge of the Sith seem way better um i watched the same videos about a phantom menace and attack of the clones not so much but um essentially what it is is that when uh when he kills dooku and anakin does he says it's not the jedi way and then obviously palpatine says do it and he does it and he regrets it and he says i shouldn't have done that and the jedi don't really mention it again but then obviously the whole thing is anakin's kind of losing he's thinking he's losing his wife he's feeling a bit disillusioned with the order they say he can't be a master so he feels like he's being isolated he's then being told he's basically his best friend who isn't obi-wan who isn't really his friend anyway but um his best friend palpatine he's being told to spy on him so every 
way he's looking at is basically going, oh shit, I, I, where do I turn? I've got my code. I've got the Jedi code. I've, I'll have i stick to that my best, even though I've fallen off it once or twice or see Attack of the Clones. But it's like, you know, try and stick to the code. Try and not be bad. And then when he's at this point where it's like, this is the ultimate time for the Jedi to show me they are actually the good guys in the universe and the Jedi and the Sith aren't the same, like Palpatine's been saying. Mace Windu standing over Palpatine saying and anakin's going no you should you should put him away you know we should do what you've said we should do the jedi way we should not kill someone and mace windu's gone no and at that moment anakin realizes and i want to clarify i think i'm giving george lucas too much credit here um is i think anakin then realizes oh well the jedi and the sith as palpatine said in one of the previous scenes are basically the same thing it's just slightly different perspective and they kind of give each other excuses it's just that the sith don't lie about it and that's the moment when anakin realizes and then he goes full dark side and stuff and that perspective actually made me like the movie a lot more because when you watch the scenes together, it does actually marry up very, very closely. I I can accept that, and actually, that I, I do think that that there are there are hints of that throughout the, the Revenge of the Sith, definitely. You know where like, um, you know, he's obviously having these visions of of, of Padme dying, and it's, it's actually of all the people that are trying to sort of act actually act as a real friend and even though he's obviously the, the evil emperor uh, and the sith lord palpatine actually does give him some good advice you know he sort of says about um this thing and you know i know he's trying to tempt him to the dark side so i will actually fully understand that i could understand that mace windows actions are actually what turns him to the dark side and what sort of really pushes him over the edge and i would accept that it is a sort of a, you know, it's something where he's gone, actually, my allegiances have changed. And, you know, I am actually now going to take the way of the Sith sort of thing. However, I still don't understand why 20 minutes later, that then justifies him killing, <laughs> a, like, a, a bunch of kids. Bit of an overreaction, really, isn't it? <laughs> it is. It's, it's sort of like, you know, yeah. seriously, it's sort of like, well, Mace Windu really let me down. So I'm going to kill some kids just to make myself feel better. Well, I think at that point he's lost everything. And then Emperor, the Emperor does say to him, he's like, you know, go to the Jedi Temple, show no mercy. Only once you become strong enough in dark side energy, basically, can you become strong enough to save your wife. He does actually say that to Anakin. And obviously, mm. when he says, you have to go there, kill everyone. Dark side is doing bad things. The worse you do, the more powerful you'll be and the more likely you'll be able to save Padme. And at that point, he's basically just lost everything and he doesn't really give a crap about anything anymore. And I do agree. I mean, the, you know, obviously, the justification of killing children is null. But in to be fair, Palpatine does actually say before he does that, show no mercy. Only when you've shown no mercy will you be strong enough to save your wife. And that's why, obviously, when he does it, it actually cuts to his face when he light, ignites his lightsaber and there's a... It's either then there's a tear or it's when he's on Mustafar and there's a tear. I can't remember which one. But he does show some degree of, I can't go back now. I've fucked up, essentially. But 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 all this sort of shows... I mean, the one thing I will say, you know, I, I don't know if it's intentional or not, but you know when he walks into that hall and all the, those kids are there, the younglings are mm. there, and they say to him, they say, you know, Master Skywalker, or they say sort of, you know, um, Skywalker, we can't, you know, what's going to happen to us? And the lights, the lights are, that kid, like... Some, they must have do something because that kid jumps, mm. like he legit jumps, and he yeah. looks like because he's you know his line delivery is awful, <laughs> but his reaction to that lightsaber going on is genuine fear. Yeah. And I'm like, what? What did they do <laughs> to like scare that kid? <laughs> but um, but you know you know what I would say Scott as well then guys is in this day and age, Anakin has a very good case for actual corporate bullying. Because the way <laughs> every time he comes up with a good idea or solves something, like when he says about him being a Sith Lord and that, someone just comes in and goes, oh, no, you take a back seat. And someone else comes in and steals a funder. We've all worked with people like that. <laughs> it, it, you know, you confide in him. And next minute they're like, oh, I've got a great idea. And you're like, yeah, you bastard. I just fucking told you. And he has got a good case for constructive dismissal, to be fair. But what I find bizarre is this whole thing about saving Padme and that, you know, saving your wife he's having these nightmares that she dies which having the baby and all that and he's quite open with her about it and all that why the fuck did he then grab her around the neck if he was really trying to save her i know he changed i know all this and she came to say like you've changed and you're not the person and blah 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 surely at that point he should have said hang on a minute i'm supposed to save her from dying that's why i'm here that's why i've killed all these people and then it just it for me that I know it had to become Darth Vader, it had to become the absolute 
uh, nut job that he is, the scrupulous, you know, completely driven character. But I just find the whole build up to why he has to be, go to the dark side to save her, to then actually just throw her to the ground, which sort of causes her to die. I found that really Wait, stupid. He only he only does it to be fair when he sees Obi Wan. He initially is just talking to her, and they're having a fairly normal conversation. As soon as he sees Obi Wan, that's when he does that, and he goes. Oh, so you have betrayed me, like as in the final straw, essentially. Like, I've done all this for you. I've d- killed children. Um, I've done, you know, all this horrendous stuff. All of it is 100% just so you and I can be together. And now you've brought someone here to kill me. And in that moment when he does it, um, I'm going to say something quicker, actually, is when he does that, he, when Vader is Vader at the end of episode three, uh, Edge of the Sith, and he says, um, you know, Palpatine. He speaks to him and he goes, oh, how are you doing? Blah, blah. And he goes, oh, how's Padme? And he goes, oh, it seems in your anger you killed her. And then he does the ho- horrible no bit, which let's try and forget <laughs> that. When that bit and he says, no, but I felt her. I felt her being alive sort of thing. He didn't actually kill her. I know, and, you know, everyone was saying, Anakin, that's enough, blah, blah, blah. But to be fair, he didn't act. I'm not saying it's right. It's basically trying to justify domestic abuse. But he, you know, it's like, oh, she stepped out of line, just smack her around a bit, choke her, leave her to the floor. Once she wakes up a bit again, she'll be fine. And obviously, it's not justifiable, but it's, he didn't, to be fair, kill her. Even though I do see the problem is with Revenge of the Sith, I find, is that it's, if they had more time, if they made it into a series or something, then, or when you watch the series of the Clone Wars, it explains Anakin's sort of slow descent to the dark side a bit more. Whereas in. Revenge of the Sith, it seems like at the start he's a golden boy, and then about halfway through he just completely flips and be- becomes like the worst, most evil person ever. Like, you don't even see Palpatine kill children. So it's like they do yeah. it a bit too quick, and they're not, because obviously Lucas doesn't do subtleties. So it's only, how do we show he's really, really, really bad? We just cut the arm off, the only black guy in Star Wars and the prequels. So let's now have him kill children, and that'd be it. And then he's instantly the most evil person ever. And it's just like, uh. It's a bit, like, I think. You say about Luke has not been able to do subtlety, and I think that's a big, big part of this. I also think Hayden Christensen isn't... He's hes perfectly fine. I've seen him in other films, and he's perfectly fine. He's a, he's a, you know, he's a relatively capable actor. <clears throat> but there's been a film recently that shows that when you have a really committed and nuanced performance in certain films, even if, you know, in my opinion, the rest of the film is a little bit meh, you can really learn a lot. And I'm thinking about the, I'm thinking about Joker, <clears throat> So when you have someone of like Joaquin Phoenix's level of you know performance giving you a delivery where you know you can see that there's that descent into madness and cruelty and you know and degradation, like that film is is, is him falling to the dark side. He go he starts in a bad place and he gets to a worse place. That's what Revenge of the Sith should have been. Like mm. if you had that, you you could do that performance where you could show those sort of ticks and that nuance of sort of like, oh, you know, every time he gets a bit under pressure, he, um, you know, you can see that something's happening or there's a slight, there's another change, there's another step, there's whatever. That when you get to that point of him feeling betrayed, him actually abusing and assaulting Padme, you could be like, that feels like the end of this journey. Like yeah, he, this is hit. This is it now. But it doesn't feel like that. It just feels like another snap turn. It's like and again, and again, and again. Like they're just little snap turns constantly, rather than a, de- a devolution into into darkness. It just feels like it feels like a fourteen year old emo, basically sort of feeling like you know, life's life's unfair, man. Oh, it's just so unfair. No one takes me seriously. It's rubbish. It's like, by the end of this film, I'm just like, grow the fuck up. He's holding me back. Like, that's, <laughs> yeah. It's like, well, that's, that, do you know what? That's the other point. That you make a really good point, Dave, because the other thing is, at no point is Anakin Skywalker his own man. So he goes back from being bossed around by the Jedi, and although he disagrees with them and keeps trying to stand up, like, he backs down constantly. You know, he will say, okay, you know, uh, to Obi Wan or to Mace Windu or the council, okay, that, you know, it, then he goes off and bitches about it. But then instead of standing up and becoming his own man, he then goes and becomes um, Darth Sidious's bitch and just goes around and do, does his dirty work. So, again, all I, I all I can think of for Darth Vader now is he's just another bully boy. Like, again, all these films do is take away what makes a character that has become iconic great and just chucks it away. 
Yeah, I think mm, I disagree. I think the biggest to some degree. <laughs> problem with it all, I, and I agree on the pace of it, all the the switching. But I I think you, at no point in this trilogy did I ever really care about Anakin. Now, mm. if you look at the original trilogy, if in the Return of the Jedi Luke had have made that change, he'd have switched over to the dark side instead of uh, the good then I think we'd have cared about it because as as much as he's a whiny little bitch as well, we cared about him. But I just think there's nothing likeable about Anakin. So you don't see that descent of a hero. You know, he has these bad things that happen and chip away at him. And so it's almost kind of inevitable. You know, you mentioned about Joaquin Phoenix. I mean, it, it felt like in that movie he was on a journey that was almost inevitable because of the environment that he was in and everything and you kind of cared about him at no point do I care about Hayden Christensen in this trilogy mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I think one of the things about Luke Skywalker which is interesting is is you know we didn't really mention but when you look at A New Hope A New Hope is a um, <clears throat> a classic hero's journey like it is almost um you know, by the book, literally by the book, Campbellian, Campbellian um, the hero's journey, you know, the hero of a thousand faces kind of thing. Like Joseph Campbell, sort of like, this is the hero's journey. They sort of, the call to action, they meet the you know the stranger, they learn their power, they do whatever the seven or nine steps are. Like it literally follows those things. So although Luke's a bit whiny, you know, in, in, in the character, like he does go on a hero's journey. So by the end, you've taken a sort of, um, a sort of a farm boy from from the middle mm-hmm. of nowhere, and he actually does become the hero of the rebellion. Fantastic, it works. So that when he does sort of like has dabblings with the dark side in in uh, Empire and Jedi, it feels like there's a threat there because it's sullying this hero's mm-hmm. journey that's gone before, and you do feel that's terrible. Anakin doesn't have that hero's journey. He just sort of turns up. <laughs> the pod race. Uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, wins a pod race, and then it, it, they're off to the races of him becoming the baddie. Well, I think that's about the problem. I think is that obviously the thing that kind of is thrown around in the prequel prequels quite a lot is the mention of that prophecy, um, which gets you know mentioned. Yoda at one point says maybe the prophecy misread could have been blah. Um, when it is one of those things where I, I do agree with you. I want to clarify and disagree at the same time. I do think that the the walking phoenix example in Joker should have been was absolutely excellent. The descent to madness film um, perfection almost and. Revenge of the Sith 100% was not that. And I think the the problem is as well, I, I will to kind of defend it, is even in, as you guys said earlier, or we said earlier, in the, the posters for Phantom Menace, there was pictures of Jake Lloyd next to a Vader uh, uh, shadow. So the whole time, even if nothing bad is really happening, you're constantly being reminded, this is what made Vader Vader. This is what made Vader Vader. And we know that obviously Whacking Phoenix was going to become the Joker, but we didn't know what iteration of the Joker it was going to mm-hmm. be. And all the Jokers are very different. So it's like, oh, what? almost what kind of Joker is he going to become? Maybe something mm. completely new. Whereas in the prequels, it was like, here's this universe. We have to kind of make it this giant thing into something small. And it should have just started as something smaller anyway. But And then from the whole time, you've got a little kid that no one really likes. Children actors are quite annoying anyway. So the first film is just a write-off because you probably could have been, apart apart from probably Stranger Things, I think I hate every child and almost everything anyway. And then in Attack of the Clones, it was like, "Mm, yeah, he maybe could have done a bit better in in that sort of regard. But he was basically really, really shit dialogue with a really bland uh, love story of no chemistry. Really didn't help matters. I think that the Tusken Raider scene is really powerful. And that's actually one of my favorite scenes in Attack of the Clones. I think when he ignites that lightsaber and he slices, and you mentioned Mm -hmm. earlier that you hear the echoing screams of the Tusken Raiders. That's really, really, really cool. But then in Revenge of the Sith, it's like he's kind of flipped back a bit but you don't quite see that that subtleties, you said, the darkness kind of forcing through, but you're still constantly being reminded he is Vader. You're constantly all the time, everything. And Star Wars has got such a big weight behind it, and obviously everyone was excited for Phantom Menace, and then they fucked it up. And immediately, there's so many people who haven't watched the other Star Wars films or even haven't watched Revenge of the Sith because they were like, the first two are so bad that you can't almost recover from that. And I, I think that's part of part of the problem in The Descent to Vader's madness, to Vader as well, is that they kind of screwed themselves over so bad they almost couldn't recover from it in a sense. Mm. Like, I do agree, but I don't want to put that up as well. Like, no, I want no, to it's, it's a fair point. No, no, it's, and this is the thing, like, it can be, you know, that, that was just, you know, I say my perception. I, I can see what you're saying. I do agree. Um, but yeah, it just, like I said, there's just so much crammed into Revenge of the Sith that it just mm. sort of, 
as you say, if 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 they'd have gone down the sort of as they did later on with like you know the the Harry Potter films, even the Twilight films, they're just breaking it into two and actually saying actually there's so much for us to tell. Just admit it, like there's so much to tell. Hmm. We're gonna have three and three point five. <laughs> <laughs> Padme is dying because we can't be asked to write a, <laughs> a realistic way that she's going to die. Do you know what's Although the most annoying Mike's part about that? It. <laughs> yes, I'm sorry. The thing is, it's actually one of my favourite parts about Star Wars, and it is, weirdly enough, the most subtle thing George Lucas has ever done, and it is so annoying because one of the very few things that shouldn't be that subtle, okay? Now, if you listen really closely with like headphones on and the volume turned up ridiculously high, when Padme is dying and Vader's putting his suit on, um, <clears throat> excuse me you can actually hear a heartbeat and you actually hear the heartbeat of it's meant to be Padme <laughs> slowing down and then it stops for a moment and Vader's suit gets put on and it starts up again and then she's gone and what the whole thing when the Empress said it seems like in your anger you killed her sort of thing and when the droid person says oh it seems like she's just kind of given up on life if you actually really look into a lot of the details and things and maybe it wasn't George's Lucas intention but it was that she she died because what was actually happening was Vader's final... The way Vader survived after having three legs cut off set on fire, the only way he survived was kind of draining force energy from Padme once he was with the Emperor. The only way the Emperor kept him alive after finding him was actually... Because he wasn't on any medical unit. You saw him when he was being carried around. I don't know if he had a face mask thing on a little bit, but he didn't have any IV drips connected up to him. He didn't have anything. And obviously with the dark side, is meant to be that thing of through bad means you can either live forever or live ridiculously strong or whatever and obviously Palpatine knew a way that Plagueis could kind of live forever or bring people back to life and a lot of it is leaning on that mainly the heartbeat thing kind of swings at home for me a bit is and the scene where they're showing Padme and then Vader and then Padme and Vader back and forth constantly is that him and Palpatine kind of took the energy out of Padme which made her air quotes give up on life which made Vader able to survive long enough to put the suit on now I want to clarify that if that was put in the film properly for an extra two minutes would have changed probably most people's perspective of the whole ending of that film and would have been a really, really cool tie-in to Plagueis and his turn and the full circle. And instead, it's either so unbelievably subtle you have to dig so deep to find it or they didn't do that and it was just by accident. Yeah, I'm going to go with that. (laughs) Potentially. Yeah, accident. (laughs) I would not disagree with you. (laughs) It's a great theory, and I love it. I would like to quote Mike Garley. Uh, Sorry, not Mike Garley. Mike Lee Graham, who joined us on the Comics Podcast, episode 50. And he gave an explanation how this tiny little Superman could actually hold up this big sheet of ice. I don't know if you remember that from Superman 3. Yep, I remember that. And he gave this Mm -hmm. very detailed explanation that had come out of the comics, how Superman can actually hold these molecules together. And he just goes, and that is fucking bullshit. (laughs) (laughs) That is the problem. I I love these films, but the biggest problem I have with them is that when I defend them with people in in these sorts of scenarios as well, which is completely justified, every criticism you guys have all had of these films are 100% justified and it frustrates me because I love it so much and there's so many pieces of the puzzle that were not put in there because George Lucas didn't fucking think about it enough and just rushed it and didn't get people to give some sort of two cents and because of that now as i said before in the other episodes because i read all the comics and the books and everything it fills in all the gaps which is cool for me but 95 percent of people if not more who watch star wars don't want to see all that sort of stuff and they watch these crap films of the prequels and go this is a crap why would i want to watch a series set between episode two and three why the hell would i want to put myself through that and then you watch them and you go oh these actually add a lot to the films they add a lot of weight to them but you have to already like them enough to actually want to do that and it's annoying they didn't do that Here's the thing, though, like you said, you, the, the, you make a really good point there, because I'm actually going to... Do you remember that positive I mentioned a little while ago? <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm getting to it. We, 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 we should remind we listeners, start. shouldn't we? We're all passionate <laughs> about Star it. Wars. But the, the, the thing is, I would say that, st- that, that Luke, um, George Lucas is an ideas man, hmm. okay? And not all ideas people are good at detail. And that's 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 perfectly fine. Some hmm. people are just ideas men. They'll throw ideas out, and they're brilliant hmm. ideas. But then they need a filter or somebody to sort of like refine it and turn it into a valid end product. And so when you look at sort of, I know, I know Chris, you weren't a big fan of it, but George Lucas and Steven Spielberg worked together and they made um, the Indiana Jones films. Now I'm going to ignore 
um, the fourth one because nobody <laughs> should ever watch that travesty. But <laughs> I re- I, I'm a bit like you. I love um, uh, Raiders, Temple, and, and Last Crusade. Like they they are some of my favourite films. And that, yeah, there are flaws. Like you know, again, I can completely completely acknowledge that if Indiana Jones did nothing in the first film, uh, you'd still end up with exactly the same result at the end of the film. But there's still elements of that that George Lucas's ideas. There were a lot of George Lucas's ideas pushed through the filter of Steven Spielberg, and you get to me a classic. And I think that's the problem with these that you don't have a filter. If he had someone, say like a Spielberg or somebody else, a Lawrence Kasdan or somebody else, that could he could go, look, I've got all these ideas. Right? I've got Metachlorians, right? But I've also got Darth Maul, and I've got this, and I've got that, and they're gone, right? Well, that's really good. I like that idea. Metachlorians, well, let's not do that because that sounds crap. So forget that. But do you know what? I really like this idea of the, you know, the what you're doing with the Sith and right. Let's let's tone down the Trade Federation. But do you know what? The action you've got going on here is really good, and that that could have made these into because something brilliant because there are nuggets constantly in these films that like you say if you scratch away you go there's something really good in these films the ideas are actually really good they're just not well delivered Mm -hmm. Mm. and i think that's the travesty of these i also think as well uh, over the whole thing somebody who obviously had the initials uh gl cast all the wrong people other than I think Liam Neeson, for these prequels to me, I don't think there's anybody in there who, who was a great actor or acts great. As you said about dialing it in, Dave, and just, you know, I think every one of them is just taking the piss, really. They, they sort of think, wow, we're on a Star Wars set. Whereas you look at, I know we're in the future now and stuff, and it's around our time, but you look at Daisy Ridley and the rest of the cast there, they genuinely look happy to be on set. You know, and I know mm-hmm. we didn't we didn't have the social media stuff back in '99 and the early 2000s and stuff. When, like you said before, Mike, and you're right, but no one in this film looks fucking happy at all. Nobody, and I know they're acting and stuff, but you, there's no passion in what they're doing for me. I mean, like I say you and McGregor, and, and I'm in our group here. I'm actually taking the piss by calling myself Wooden McGregor because he is, and he's a good actor. You and McGregor, he's a nice bloke, but and, and I saw it the other week. Everyone's fucking wanking themselves silly because they're doing an Obi Wan fucking mini series. It's like, hello, has nobody forgot how bad he is in these fucking films? Everyone's like creaming themselves, going, "Oh my god, it's true." So fucking what if he comes out <laughs> acting the way he did? It's not going to be what everyone wants. It's unfortunately, time is a great healer, and and that will be an absolute shit show, I think, because he's not going to improve on his Obi Wan at all. I think with, I mean, Kenobi, I'm excited for the Kenobi series and Kenobi was actually my favorite Star Wars character. Uh, funnily <laughs> enough, I was going to put it in there. Um, I'm going to it all back. <laughs> no, it's fine. It's Indiana fine. Jones I, I will... is, is uh, Scott's favorite as well and Chris shit all over him. So. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> but um, with Obi-Wan, I will say, when I think of Obi-Wan, I think of Alec Guinness's Obi-Wan in episode four and I think of Obi-Wan in episode three. I think episode two, Obi-Wan, I actually don't mind. But when me and Megan watched episode two, she was like, she watched episode one. She was like, well, Obi-Wan's barely even in it. So I don't, when I think of Obi-Wan, I keep forgetting he didn't have a beard at one point because he's so forgettable in that film. Mm. It's like, oh yeah, he's vaguely in it. I know he kills Darth Maul at the end, but that's basically it. And um, Qui-Gon does most of the fighting anyway. But um, he, in the second one, yeah, he's quite wooden. And even Megan, when she watched it, she was like, I really love Ewan McGregor, but this is the worst I've ever seen him act in my life in, a, in Attack of the Clones. Mm. And then when episode three came out, she was like, he's not as, he's not amazing in this, but he is all right. But then he's good at the end. And it's like, obviously I really like him. When I watched it when I was really young, I didn't, I, I've kind of got this lens where I watched it when I was so young, I didn't really understand good or bad acting. And then I've kind of grown to love it. And I kind of just have like a glaze over a lot of the, the, the bad stuff in these films and things. But I will say one thing that's redeeming about the three of them is I think all three of them, in my opinion, have really, really good endings. And I know you may not agree, not necessarily plot-wise or the very, very end, but I mean, the big battle stuff at the end, I think the Darth Maul battle is amazing. I think the Geonosis battle, once you know, the Jedi actually, once the, the creatures go in the pit and stuff, start fighting, I think that's really, really awesome after the Droid Factory and shit and the Dooku fight. And then I think that the Anakin Obi-Wan fight is one of my favourite scenes in any movie because the choreography is so good that it kind of makes up for a lot of the rest of it. But that's kind of just my two cents almost on those parts no do you know what that was my that that was my positive 
Oh, I sorry, I stole that from you. No, 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 you, no, you didn't, because I think you were totally right. I think the thing I'd say about these films is that I actually like you, McGregor. I think you know, I recently watched um, Doctor Sleep, and oh, was that good? Whilst I found it, uh, it's all right. You know, it's again, it's one of those films that sort of realizes it has an iconic film to follow, so shoehorns in a bunch of stuff that doesn't mm. need to be there, but it's not bad. But he's actually really, really good in it, um, and I actually do like you, McGregor. I think he's a fantastic actor, and again, <clears throat> I think he was hampered by. You see it more in the second one than the third. This desire to try and sort of ape an Alec Guinness sort of um, accent and you know demeanor, and it sort of like it doesn't do anything for him. It sort of it really sort of I think it's a bit of a uh, a burden for him, mm. and he sort of drops it for the third one and becomes a bit more sort of relaxed, and it, I think it really pays off. Um, but what I would say is I think the action in these films and the choreography for the fight scenes um, is brilliant. I think I, I honestly think when you look back at the original trilogy, sort of those um, the lightsaber battles, as again, like, as I think Chris, you sort of made it abundantly clear as well that the lightsaber fight between Darth Vader and um, Obi Wan in A New Hope is pitiful. Like it, it's just <laughs> it's it's so robotic and wooden, it's awful. And the fight between the fights that eventually happen between sort of Luke and Darth Vader and stuff, and that, they're all right. They're not too bad, you know. They're, they're set up well. But they're a little bit lumpy in places, and a little bit sort of, you know, uh, they're a bit. They, they feel a bit er, um, Errol Flynn, you know, sort of like <laughs> sweep for their legs and jump. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, yes, yeah, right. Yeah. But in this, like, you know, the fight between um, Qui Gon and Darth Maul when he fights him on on the sand, and then the final fight in that um, wherever it is with the with the double ended lightsaber and stuff it is brilliant, like. I can't deny that, and I agree that sort of the action in these films is actually like spot on. I will happily, and you, you are totally right about the fight between um, Anakin and, and <clears throat> Obi Wan at the end of Revenge of the Sith. Is it's something to behold? Like, really? I mean, granted, there's some there's some awful background special effects, <laughs> but but what what you McGregor and Hayden Christensen are bringing into that fight is incredible. Mm. you watch the bad behind the scenes things and it's like they actually a lot of the bits they were doing literally at speed and there's a bit right at the start where they're literally it's like Hayden Christensen like let's say because left right left right left right left right basically onto you would be you McGregor's shoulders and he's like deflect, deflect, deflect and you watch it in real time they haven't sped up or anything and you're like they actually learnt to do all these things and it, as you say it doesn't look like that sort of jumping around bit but one thing I want to flag up actually which is my favorite Star Wars music is actually in the prequel, is in actually the Phantom Menace and Revenge of the Sith, and that's Duel of Fates. And I think mm. that Duel, I mean, with the prequels, I think one way to look at them is kind of George Lucas is so visual and so not script based. If you muted the film and you just didn't really pay attention to any dialogue, they'd be pretty brilliant. But obviously, you know, that's me being overly, you know, over the top about it. But the music of Duel of Fates, when, you know, when you first see Darth Maul properly, like when the, the, the doors open up on the Thieve Palace and he's there and Obi-Wan and um, Qui-Gon are like, oh shit. And it's that, oh, da, dee, da, da, that bit. And da, 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 da. that that for me is Star Wars. Like whenever I watch the prequels and I watch through the pithy dialogue and I get to the bit where, you know, Obi-Wan's fighting um, Anakin or when they both fight Dooku, I think it's quite cool. Or, you know, when um, they're fighting Darth Maul, I go, all the rest of it is just kind of background noise to me. And this fighting with blazer swords is just so fucking cool to me i don't really in all honesty care that much about what happens before it obviously i do but you know what i mean like it's it's like so much more background noise because i just love those bits so much that's why i can kind of shrug off a lot of the crap things with the prequels i acknowledge they're there and i can acknowledge jar jar i fucking hate him hope he dies but he um you know if i can put up with jar jar i get to watch that darth maul battle and I'm all right with that, to be honest. <laughs> but uh, I think with the with the Anakin and Obi Wan fight, I do have to call out because it does look great. I don't quite know how Obi Wan manages to chop both his legs and an arm off. I, 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 that it's an arc, uh, right? He doesn't. He does a full. It's a full arc um, in the comic. I think it is of the comic of the Revenge of the Sith. It shows how he does it. It's like a specific arc movement, and it is a bit bullshit. <laughs> but it's like if you imagine where someone jumps at you, and as they jump at you, if you put your lightsaber where above the head, 
and then you spin in a C shape, you go past one arm, both legs, and then away from you, you can actually do that. I thought you were going to call out where they're swinging on those giant ropes oh, no, and swinging no, no. Oh, each no. other. So, so, so that, that, I mean, yeah, some, some of that is a bit hokey. But again, okay, I can go with that. You can chop off both legs and an arm in this arc type fashion. In a very, very, very rarely. Obi-Wan. It's like almost impossible. <laughs> Obi-Wan is a fucking prick. Because essentially, <laughs> he's, li- he's saying to Anakin, I loved you like a brother. You know, you're supposed to bring balance to the Force. You're supposed to destroy the Sith. You know, but that line, you know, I loved you like a brother. He's basically chopped his arms and leg off, uh, his legs and one arm off. He's trying to go up. He's set on fire and he just fucking leaves him there. I mean, surely you would have to put him out of his misery. I don't think he could do it. I don't think he could do the final blow. I think that's the kind of the problem. He kind of also I know he says all that stuff and he's very upsetting, but obviously if you when you're watching it, Anakin does all the first blows, essentially. Every time they have some sort of mild piece, like when they're on the blow of a bit before they get to that big hill. Obi Wan he's talking to him and he's like, you know, I have failed you, Anakin, I have. You know, and then he's like, Oh, from my perspective, the Jedi are the ones that are blah blah blah. And then he says, Then you are lost or whatever. And then Anakin jumps at Obi Wan and swings his lightsaber. And each time when they first fight, Anakin pulls his lightsaber and launches at Obi Wan. So Obi Wan knows constantly that he's that Anakin's gonna be the one attacking him without force. And also, Obi Wan did watch CCTV footage of him slaughtering children oh, yeah. about an hour before. So I think probably letting him be on fire and cutting his legs off and kind of leaving him there. <laughs> He's a brutal kind of way it, to it. see off your brother. <laughs> <laughs> well, after watching him also choke his wife in front of you as well, his pregnant wife, it's like... Yeah. Well, I, I can yeah. buy that. You know, if, if the Jedi stop being such pious bastards, you know, and just say, right, <laughs> set on fire, have that, you bitch. You know, just... I can get that, but just try and be all high and mighty and basically watching someone that you say you love suffer like that. I, j- I just thought that was that was pretty wrong. No. You know that line that you, you know that line you just mentioned there about uh, where Anakin says, you know, from my perspective, uh, the the Jedi are the, mm-hmm. the baddies or whatever. Mm. So you know, obviously, um, Obi Wan decks him and sort of leaves him there, sort of a bit of a you know, like say a, a bit of a charred mess. So when later on in, um, is it? I think it's in Empire, when he sort of says, you know, about um, I might be Return of the Jedi. I can't remember, but he, he says about um, you said that Darth Vader killed killed my father, uh, and he says, well, he did from a certain perspective. Is that Obi Wan being funny? <laughs> Like using the word perspective, is he, is he having himself a little personal joke there? Well, from my perspective. Uh, he did. <laughs> it, it just, I don't know, it just sort of, I don't know if that's another sort of thing they're trying to shoehorn in, but it just feels like a bad, it makes, again, it makes Obi-Wan sound like a bit of a cock later well, on. I think it's because he sees the CCTV footage of Palpatine saying, you are no longer Anakin Skywalker, you are now Darth Vader. And then immediately after that, he's killing children. And then immediately after that, he's choking oh, his no, wife in front that. of him. No, no, it's uh, that, 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 that I get. It's more the fact he uses the word from a certain perspective, oh, I see it's what like you the mean. fact he, from, well, you know, you, you know, from a certain from perspective, from a certain point of view, he did, <laughs> yeah. And I'm like, well, that's short. That's now you're just aping what Anakin said to you, which sort of like is you. Are you trying to be funny? I'm um, pretty sure that um, uh, I'm gonna, not going to be able to back this up with facts, but I'm pretty sure some of the early drafts of Empire Strikes Back had Anakin being a, a Force ghost. You know, so being uh, nothing to do with Darth Vader, and and again, it just mm. I, I I don't have it to hand, but I'm pretty sure that is the case. And so again, this whole um, idea of the nine chapters all being written out and mapped out, you know, beforehand, it, it is just bullshit. Mm. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I think you know we've gone through. The, uh, we've sort of gone through the prequel trilogy, so I think what we'll do is just to round things out. We'll have some final thoughts uh, just on these three films, and uh, to sort of end on, uh, we'll try to end on a positive. So, Mike, I'm gonna I'm gonna save you till last. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, Chris, what are your final thoughts then on uh, episodes one, two, and three? <clears throat> just clearing my throat now, Scott, for this. Um... <laughs> No, I, I think 
what Mike said is right and what you both said. A lot of the battles are fantastic. Unfortunately, Phantom Menace is just weighed down by the comedy genius that is Jar Jar Binks. It's fucking terrible. You can even see at one point, I forgot to mention it, Hayden Christensen's trying to talk to, obviously, the guy who's got the head mask on to be Jar Jar, like they did when, obviously, we're going forward now, but Endgame, Josh Brolin's character, they had to look a certain angle because he's supposed to be seven foot tall or whatever. He's clearly, they have, nobody knows where to look on Jar Jar Binks because it's just absolutely awful. He's probably one of the worst characters I've ever seen in a movie. And this time I genuinely see why everyone hates him because it, it's literally the whole movie ruined. And I think what clogs down the first two films, he's just fucking po- politics, utter shit about politics. Nobody gives a fuck about that. Just go around and get a, a bit of a fight going, a bit of a chase going, like to start New Hope and all that. I don't give a fuck about these trade things or what's going on. And to be honest, even now, having seen these movies a few times, I still don't know what they're going on about. Um, <laughs> I genuinely don't. I think I think the actual plot lines, and I love I love what you say, Mike. Is the, the, and we said it when we first started doing the, the obviously the Star Wars uh, whole thing that we're doing, the collaboration is. They just wrote shit afterwards because there were so many bad bits of continuity, different things. They just wrote stuff afterwards that someone... And it's right, Mike. I love the fact that you've got so much knowledge over that. And you were right what you say. Nobody know. I didn't know any of this until you said. I, I really want to explore it to see how much bullshit has gone into all this, making the story look, fill it out and that, so we all understand it. Because I found it really interesting and I will... Honestly, Mike, I will pursue that after we we finished all this. But I just think the shit, and I think Revenge of the Sith is a good film that, unfortunately, it's bogged down by the rest of the shit that's gone before it. I, I actually quite enjoy it. I, I like you, McGregor, because Obi-Wan's got a bit of bollocks, as I said before, and I do like the ending. And for me, the one thing of the whole three trilogies that still gives me goosebumps is the minute you hear Darth Vader breathe, and then he comes up and he says, rise. And that, for me, is perfect. Uh, but everything else is just shit. <laughs> so, that's why my, 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 I try to go a bit more in depth, but I simply can't. It's just just crap. It's fantastic. No, yeah, I, it's, a, it's a valid opinion. Uh, Dave, what do you think? What are your thoughts? I love Star Wars so much. Uh, and it all stems from uh, years ago with the original trilogy in particular. Um, and I keep coming back to this prequel trilogy. And I keep thinking that time is a great healer. And then I get so annoyed that it's really not. But but <laughs> through all of the movies, there is something redeemable about all of them. They're just all too long. And actually, I wonder if you could distill this down i don't even mean to an hour and a half you know in some cases it might just be 60 minutes or something (laughs) i reckon you could chop these up and actually make good movies out of them you know so Mm. you think like a two good movies yeah Mm. you think like the darth maul stuff in the first one um some of the uh you know when the clones first appear you know to to do the rescuing in the second one the the fight with Anakin and Obi Wan that we've talked about, you know, there are some really great moments in there. I mean, we, we, things that negatives I haven't touched on. You know, I think Brian Blessed is a national treasure. Absolutely love everything that he's been in, except for <laughs> Phantom Menace, where he's boss Nass, and I just think that's horrendous. Uh, jumping Frog Yoda. We, we didn't really touch on that. I just think that's horrendous as well. So I just think. This it really is a yin and yang. There's so much good, but there's so much bad, and so I'm glad we've gone back through this, and I can kind of look look at the movies objectively. I think probably on balance, you know, I've come across more negative than positive, but I do think it's it's almost fifty fifty going through this, and I just. I, I'm sad because it's all such a missed opportunity because I think they could have been great. I mean, you take that skeleton of a story, you know, you take this fallen hero who becomes the ultimate badass uh, of the universe or, or the galaxy rather. Um, and as Chris said there, the moment when he becomes Darth Vader, you know, you've got this charred human and the way his eyes just seem to open with a fear 
Um, I, I just think it's amazing. And, and again, if they'd have just deleted the no bit, you know, <laughs> I think that could have been so powerful as well. You know, even if it had just screamed instead of shouting no, I think that would have been better. So, yep, delighted we've gone back. I can't redeem these prequels. Um, but like I say, if, if someone were to edit them, chop them up and make some shorter movies out of them, I, I think you could make some pretty good movies. That's good. Thanks for that. I think before we get to to Mike, I'll just quickly throw my two cents in as well. I think I've got to echo what you say there. It's it's there are nuggets of things in these films that sort of like you know that I can go. I I do like that. I do like that. So you know, as I said the action. I think is is for the most part is pretty good. I think that they say the the Darth Maul Qui Gon Obi Wan fight in the first film is 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 good. Um, I think I, I actually think elements of the pod race look good, if not story wise. I think there's parts of in um, Attack of the Clones that look good, like, as, as, as Mike's alluded to earlier. Like the end part is actually pretty good, the sort of the finale. And with Revenge of the Sith, yeah, again, there are little bits and pieces that you can go, that's great in the story. I love this. I love that. That's great. Unfortunately, it's sort of like covered by this mass of just utter shit that just hides all this goodness. And I think... A lot of the things we talk about today, you see all these modern films, and especially with Disney, and, and you know they talk about Star Wars a lot. This idea of corporate, um, you know, banality. This sort of these films just become bland and the same thing because the corporates. Let's give those these auteur directors, you know, a, a chance to give us something that they, give us their vision. Well, ladies and gentlemen, George Lucas gave us his vision, and it was horrendous like it's you know this is one of those things where you wish that someone in corporate had stepped in and said george we need to sort of tailor this and do something different and we're going to be the filter um you know i've got these dvd i've got these the funny thing is i have the original series the original trilogy and i know i ripped into those a bit before but i've got the original trilogy on blu-ray uh steelbook editions and i love those i've got them as well i've got yeah, I've got all the new editions, um, you know, on Blu-ray, and they sit, you know, and I've got those, all of them, even solo. Um, but these, I've never updated from the, the DVDs, and if and the thing is, these the, the three of these films sit in the attic, in the, the I've got a box of DVDs in the attic, and they sit in there because I very, very rarely these are, you know, will go back to these, and even after watching this, I wonder if I ever need to go back to these. I know the story, I know the content. But I don't get enough enjoyment from these to dedicate two and a bit hours for each, per film to go back and watch them, to be perfectly honest. So, yeah, it'll be, it'll be interesting to see what I think of these in the future. But, Mike, what are your thoughts? <laughs> um, I was just... Yeah. Mm. No worries. Okay, yeah, no worries at all. See you later. See you later. Cheers, mate. mate. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So yeah, so Mike, so what what are your final thoughts then? How do you wrap up on the prequel trilogy? Um it's kind of I've got two lenses essentially. It's the there's the one lens which is the objective, watching them as films sort of thing, and not thinking about any additional content, and they are incredibly, incredibly flawed. They're downright silly and stupid in a lot of ways, and the dialogue is flatly crap in a lot of places. And I think Phantom Menace probably the is not Phantom Menace really for me the only actually enjoyable part is the ending. The rest of it is just really bland for me. I don't give a fuck about Anakin. The pod racing has never actually been interesting to me. It just seems like, hey, let's get the 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 Death Star trench run and make it so much less interesting with loads of way more annoying characters. So I never really liked that that much, but I love the end of Phantom Menace. I think Attack of the Clones, the the Obi Wan bit at the start with uh, where he's kind of he's doing that investigation stuff. I think that's quite cool. I like that, but the it gets completely undone by how boring and unnecessary and so inorganic the uh, between Anakin and uh, Padme is. You know that whole scene of them falling in love is so crap. It doesn't redeem that start bit, but I think that the end, even with Yoda jumping around and being a crazy CGI blur. I really, really like it from after the droid factory. I think the last 40 minutes of that film is actually really, really good. And it's exciting to me when you see the star Wars universe and you get all these Jedi in this big arena, which is the only time it's ever really happened. And it's really exciting. But then 
The third one, I think Revenge of the Sith is the most consistent. And I think I enjoy all of Revenge of the Sith. I think there are flaws within it, but I think generally it's quite consistent for me. And I think Revenge of the Sith is actually a good film. Um, I just think the other two are not really. Um, So that's... But being a Star Wars fan, I just feel like it's one of those things where if you... If one wants to get into Star Wars really properly, you don't have to like the prequels at all because unfortunately they're never going to change. They they just are the way they are. And what I try and do without sounding like a prick because it sounds like I'd be really patronizing. What I try and do is just be, if I do rewatch them, I try and be optimistic. I try and go, yeah, I know Jar Jar's a pain in the ass and I know that the dialogue's crap, but these other bits are so good, I'm kind of okay with it. Um, but as a little side thing, I'll say that the series in between Clone Wars, it, the series called Clone Wars, so it's set between two and three, it's really good and I would recommend it to people. But I will say, unfortunately, there's a guide online you can get which is to p- cherry pick certain episodes because even with the Clone Wars series, George Lucas still didn't learn a lesson and the whole first series is a complete write off apart from one episode. And then from there, it's like probably half, I'd say, of a six series show each episode being 20 minutes i'd say only really half of them are even worth watching so it's just the whole prequel era is kind of tainted by george lucas in a way um but yeah i i do i I do enjoy the prequels i do not think they're as good as the originals i think revenge of the sith is my favorite star wars movie altogether but that is almost purely just down to the the end i think the end of revenge of the sith is better than the end of all the other films but objectively they are just nowhere near as good as the original trilogy brilliant I, and I think it's great that you can, you can see them in that way because I think there are films <clears throat> and I've defended them on, on you know, this podcast and others as well there are films that I love that I know others really don't have time for so <laughs> you know, sometimes you can you can just enjoy a film and sort of accept it for what it is and there are other times when I think they just sort of get stuck in your craw but I just want to say thank you very much guys for today it's been a really really Good therapy session, really, to get through these. <laughs> yeah. <I'm... laughs> so, Mike, do you want to explain what we're going to be doing next? Because you know we've been we've uh, we've been on VHS Strikes Back, and we've now been on Twentieth Century Geek, and we're going to be jumping to Genuine Chit Chat next. Mm. What are we going to be doing on Genuine Chit Chat? Uh, yeah. So. Um... What we're basically going to be doing is we're going to... It's probably going to be about a two-hour-long show here, so I'll probably split it in two parts because I normally do that on my show. And I'm aiming generally for the first half to be talking about Episode 7 and Episode 8 and what our opinions are on that because they're two very, very different films. One is the very safe option, one's the very <laughs> unsafe option, to put it that way. And then the second half of the chat generally, once again, it's going to be unstructured, so it's not going to be hardline halfway through it. We're going to be trying to work out what we think is going to happen in Episode 9. There's the, the term Ben Demption, which is if Kylo Ren's going to redeem himself or not, or if anyone thinks he can, what's going to happen to Rey, what what we think is actually going to happen, how Palpatine is involved. So it's just kind of a fun, nerdy chat about basically what we've done here and in the prequels and in VHS when we were discussing uh, sort of an in-depth, in-depth look, mainly criticisms <laughs> of uh, Episode 7, Episode 8. And then we're going to basically just look into what we think Episode 9 is going to bring and what we kind of hope for it to bring. Excellent. I'm really looking forward to that chat. So, you know, um, I've got all the, the Blu-rays lined up for the for the rest of the films. Same. And I've got Steelbooks as well. And I'm excited that you've too. got Steelbooks. I didn't know anyone had Steelbooks apart from me and my mate Alex, so it's exciting to know someone else collects them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I've got I've got a whole bunch of them, and uh, they're on pride of place on one of my shelves downstairs, regardless of what my wife says about them, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> Same with me. My, my girlfriend's like, why do you have to have so many bookshelves of DVDs and Steelbooks and Blu-rays? Like, you don't understand. <laughs> <laughs> yeah i'm like yeah don't touch them they're mine yep. but, um, yeah <laughs> but thank you very much guys uh so uh mike chris dave it's been fantastic and uh i'll see you all again on uh, genuine chit chat wonderful Thanks. yeah see you then cheers scott see you guys well ladies and gentlemen there you have it another great 20th century geek episode thank you for listening If you would like to get in contact to suggest topics for future shows or just chat about everything nerdy, you can email me at 20thCenturyGeek at gmail.com. That's 20thCenturyGeek at gmail.com. Or find me on social media, Twitter, Facebook or Instagram. Just search for 20thCenturyGeek. If you would like to support the show, please go on your podcast catcher 
and leave a five-star review. I would greatly appreciate it. It raises the show in the ranks and lets more people know about the podcast. If you want to show more support for the podcast, we do have an Amazon wish list. Just go on Amazon and search for 20th Century Geek and you will find a list of books that will help with research for future podcasts. And don't forget, we love secondhand books in 20th Century Towers. Once again, thank you for listening and we'll see you next time. Thank mm-hmm. you.